commissioners and uh, I think we're close to having everybody here. So thank you to the clerk for confirming that. Um, if you could, uh, if you could just kick us off, um, Chris Ann, by reading our the land acknowledgement, please. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Okay, thank you very much. So I want to start this meeting by um, acknowledging the reappointment uh, of uh, Commissioner De Laurentiis. Yay, such great news that she was reappointed by council just last week. So we're so happy to have her back as our vice chair. Uh, she's done a brilliant job and I know she will continue to be a big asset to the commission. So welcome back. Although you never really left us, but welcome back. Um, <laughs> I want to say Joanne. I'm also uh, equally as excited to introduce a new commissioner to you today. Again, appointed by council, fresh off council last week. Uh, I'd like to introduce Commissioner Fenton Jagdo. And I would actually like, um, I'd actually love it if you would just say a few words to kick us off here and share with us why it was important to you to, to apply for this board and then be the successful candidate. So go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Councillor and Chair Robinson, uh, appreciating all the kind words. Uh, morning, everyone. My name is Fenton Jagio. I'm pleased to be here and I'm humbled to be serving alongside all the 15,000 employees who keep our city moving. Uh, a bit about myself, I'm a good Ivy Business School where I concentrated on finance and strategy in my formative years. After that, I decided to spend the majority of my career in corporate planning as well as strategy consulting, uh, jumping from a large restaurant chain based here in Canada to uh, monitor Deloitte where we helped and I specifically helped lots of infrastructure clients on thinking through their big business challenges as it relates to business finance strategy as well as innovation. Um, and from there decided that I wanted to do something a bit more entrepreneurial. Um, so left that to uh, found a couple of businesses an advertising agency out of Texas, a direct to consumer business out of San Francisco that just recently received an influx of um, investment cash from Estee Lauder, which is exciting, um, and a couple of foundations, one in particular, the BIPOC Mentor Network, seeing as though there's a disconnect between um, leaders who looked like me and how important it was for students when back in university, how important it was to find uh, people like that to help me on my career journey. So it's it's uh, it's been exciting. Uh, why transit and why the TTC? So I've been making this joke to my friends, family, and some of the staff members, and I'm gonna keep on making this joke. As soon as someone tells me to shut up, I'll stop. But the, uh, the 35 got me home from middle school and the 335 got me home from crazy nights out in my early 20s. So um, I am an avid <laughs> user of, I, I'm an avid user of the TTC and it's important to understand how transit has such an important impact on social dynamics, the way that our economy grows. And I thought, what better way to give back um, in a place where I weirdly have a, a an above average um, reservoir of knowledge. So I thought, hey, TTC makes the most sense. I also think that it's important to bring representation to a board that serves the people of Toronto who are a diverse sect. And I'm hoping to bring my skill set within strategy, within planning, as well as you know thinking through innovation to this board. So I'm in, I'm incredibly excited, and I do apologize for the uh, phone ring in the background. Um, <laughs> So that's a bit about me. Um, you know, you can find me on Twitter and the Instagrams, and I'm I'm, I'm completely open to taking questions, hearing thoughts, and uh, trying to be a good steward of uh, moving people forward. Welcome aboard! Welcome aboard! Toot toot! Madam Chair, how will we do the TTC Commissioner Hazing ritual virtually? That's I know it's <laughs> such a it's such a drag. We'll think of something. We're a creative bunch, so. Watch out, watch out Fenton. Okay, anyway, great remarks. Um, lovely to hear your background, it's very impressive. And uh, we're really excited that you're here and looking forward to your fresh perspective. I'm sure you'll be uh, invaluable as we go through the next couple of years, um, as we head you know, into the next few years, which are gonna be tough because of good old COVID. So- um, I, love, I love the challenge. All right, good, well, thank you, we're, we're pleased. Um, the approval of the minutes is next. So um, if I could have somebody approve the minutes, that would be ideal. 
Okay, I see Chair. Commissioner Bradford, and uh, I don't know if we need a seconder, but Commissioner Lai would be second. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through uh, the, kind of the, the rundown here, not the rundown, but just how, just a reminder, because um, it's a little different from City Council for those of you who sit on City Council. Um, and just to remind you that um, we will require, uh, the clerk will require an email um, request to ask for questions and speak uh, if you would like to speak. So just a quick subject line, speak questions uh, to Chris Ann. Our, our clerk, um, and just give her a heads up that that's over the case, and then we'll communicate. So, um, as you know, everybody has five minutes to ask questions and to speak. Uh, we have quite a heavy agenda today, and um, so we're going to um, just do the agenda rundown. But before I do that, if you have any technical shooting, troubleshooting issues, uh, make sure you reach out to um, our team um, that are, they're actually located at the headquarters uh, today. Um, and they will be happy to help you with the technical challenges. I also, um, as much as I'm excited about Joanne and Fenton, I'm also very excited about our time clock. Um, this is something I've been pushing for for <laughs> months, <laughs> the time clock. And the city councillors might think, wow, big deal. Uh, we have that at city council. No, this is not the city council time clock. It's a better one, new and improved. And in fact, if this pilot, and Brad Bradford loves a good pilot, uh, if this pilot of the time clock works out, city council may use our time clock. How about that? So we're, we're leaders here. We're, we're forging into new terrain with time clocks. So um, that's going to be a great tool for us to um, navigate this meeting, the new time clock, hopefully. Like I said, it's a pilot. So <laughs> we'll see if it works. Madam Chair, if we get the time clock, maybe there's hope for open payment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That will be next, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, but we're going <laughs> to head through the order paper now. Um, so I will commence that process and then we can uh, move to adopt the order paper um, um, and the items uh, held. So uh, first we have the CEO report. I'll hold that. Um, that's, I think, going to be quite um, an impressive presentation today you're going to see. And then um, ACAT uh, is up next, so I'll hold that in my name. Liquidated damages, item three for the supply, a supply of additional streetcars from Bombardier Transportation Canada. I hold that, Madam Speaker. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Carroll is holding that. And item four is state of good repair, delegated authority. I, I do have to hold that because I've got a motion on that, so I'll hold that. Presto, fair policy and collection strategy update. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to hold that. I, and just to give you a heads up on that, um, I would like to try asking public questions first, and then if um, we need to go into camera, I, I mean, I, I take the position as we all should, we should try and keep everything as open as possible, and only those things that are confidential in nature should go on camera. I think most of my questions are public questions. Okay. So we have a number of my items. My questions are public as well, Madam Speaker. Okay, so that's good to know. We have a number of items that are not public, as you know, and we're going to be shortly moving into closed session after we go through the agenda. So I'll note that. Uh, number six is consultation uh, services. Any? Does anybody want to move that? I'm happy to move I can that. Move or, it, Madam okay, sure. Councillor Carroll. No, Commissioner Carroll will move that. Mm -hmm. Done. All those in favor? Approved. That carries. Large litigation matters, and this was referred, as you'll recall, from the December 15th meeting. Um, so uh, if, if people could just make sure they're muted, that would be good. Um, large litigation matters. Um, is there anybody who wants to hold that item? I'd like to hold that, Madam Speaker. Okay, so we'll hold that in Commissioner Carroll's name. Uh, item 8, uh, we have a deputation on transit network expansion, so I'll hold that in my name, SRT Light. Life extension project. We have uh, nine deputations on, uh, and then update to TTC's corporate policy, uh, entrance connections. I, I'd be happy to move that unless somebody else would like to. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? That carries. And then um, City Council transmittal um, on the Fair Pass program. Um, Kodak, please. Uh, yeah, and you know what? That's right, um, Commissioner Lai, because we also have um, three deputations yes. on that matter. So that's perfect. Okay, so now we're going to head into um, closed session. 
Um, so, so I will uh, now read the resolution that the board recess as the committee of a whole to consider information about a position plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the TTC, labor relations, employee negotiations, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, litigation or potential litigation. So including matters before administrative tribunals and the security of property of the municipal or local board related to items three, four, five, six, and seven. So uh, just a show of hands on adopting that motion. And um, then I would ask members of the public, uh, unfortunately we have to now move in to closed session on items three, four, five, six, and seven. Uh, we will return to public session uh, and the live broadcast at the end of the session. Um, so stay tuned and thank you very much. Um, now I just tell the members that we have a two or three minute um, pause here while staff make the necessary changes to hopefully, hopefully you can hear me, but they continue to have tech issues at headquarters. Uh, they extend their apologies, but we're not ready to go yet. And uh, if you can just stand by. we are now uh, ready to go so um, we are we are officially back into public session and so I just want to make sure ask the clerk if we have quorum before we start into public session confirming that we have quorum chair okay excellent so I just want to um, uh, let the public know that we've been um, working on this agenda since 9 30 this morning and we have, we had a great uh, meeting at the uh, top of the day on the toronto coach terminal i just want to thank brian leck uh he ran a very efficient meeting i could use some lessons from him and uh he did a great job so thank you to uh mr leck for that um off the top of the morning and then uh, then since then we've been debating um issues that were confidential um we will be talking about them again this afternoon and we have a number of deputants on the items before us on three items we have deputants um so we will be hearing from them today and looking forward to that i also just want to recognize the fact that um that we had an announcement this morning about transit which really acknowledges how important transit is in in toronto and canada and uh, although we don't know all the the details yet um it's really nice to hear that funding announcement this morning uh, and acknowledging the critical role transit plays in, in our country's uh, rebuild and recovery from what we're going through. So I think we all as a commission look forward to further details on how the funding will help specifically the TTC and help us address some of our financial challenges. So this is very good news for Toronto. Um, now we're going to start with item one, which is the Chief Executive, Executive Officer's Report. So I would invite uh, our CEO, Rick Leary, to address the board um, with your, um, your remarks and presentation on achievements and, and some of the priorities and deliverables that we've been working toward. Well, thank you very much, Chair, uh, through you. And uh, good afternoon or good late morning right now to everyone at the board. I would like to welcome our YouTube viewers to today's participation of the board's uh, first 2021 virtual meeting. I would also like to congratulate our, our new commissioner, Benton Diggio, to uh, his first commission meeting as well. I had a great opportunity of speaking with him the other day, and I really look forward to uh, the strategic insight that he's going to bring to this board. Uh, and again, congratulations to uh, Vice Chair De Laurentiis as well for the reappointment. I'm going to go on, though, when I took the same welcomes, because I also want to uh, say on behalf of the TTC, we welcome the new ACAT chair, Hugo Samadzic, and uh, as well as the vice chairs, Debbie Gill. Gil Gillespie and Chris Stigius to say congratulations to the three of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Congratulations to the three of them for the uh, hard work that they perform with the ACAT 
helping us to reduce barriers in public transit and making the TTC a more accessible and inclusive uh, organization for all. I also would like to congratulate uh, and recognizing that Family Day is coming on February 15th. Just say a special congratulations to uh, Commissioner Bradford and his family for the arrival of a new little baby girl, Briar, at the end of January. So it'll be a special family day for you, sir, as well. You know, as we know, February is Black History Month. And I'd let you know that we're very proud to celebrate Black History Month here at the TTC. Across the organization, as well as in our vehicles and all of our stations, we are showcasing the accomplishments of prominent Black Canadians who have led a critical role in shaping not just Toronto, but Canada. Throughout February, their photos, along with short descriptions of their contributions, are being displayed on printed posters, digital screen messaging, social media posts, as well as a gallery of images on our website. So I can tell you that uh, we, through our social media campaign, we're getting incredible engagement, better than we've ever had in other campaigns. We also have wrapped buses and put murals on our subway trains, as well as our streetcars. And uh, along with highlighting these public figures, we're also highlighting a number of our own employees internally. The TTC, working with the Toronto and Region Chapter of Compto, have developed a poster and video campaign on TTC employees who are also Compto members that will run throughout the month of February. Their stories are personal and focus on what Black History Month means to each one of them. And I encourage everyone to, to look at this inspiring campaign. I do have to address, though, an unfortunate incident that happened at Wilson Bus Garage this past Friday night, where the Black History Month display was temporarily taken down. I want you to know that we take this, area, this issue very serious, and it is being looked into. And as you've heard me say repeatedly uh, since I've been in this job, the TTC is committed to diversity and inclusion as we wouldn't want this regrettable incident to compromise our work in this area. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on and give you a presentation of our, uh, five, on our five-year corporate plan. And so what I'm going to do is give you an overview of what we have achieved together over the past three years, as well as the uh, preview of the work that we have ahead of us over the next 18 months as we continue the important work outlined in our 2018 to 2022 corporate plan. Now, my, my presentation today is going to highlight our accomplishments, our opportunities, and uh, our plans, all with the goal of continuing the transformation and modernization of the TTC to make the system better for today. And as many of you here as talk about here at the TTC, it's about the future and decades to come. I will point out this is not a, a fully inclusive list. It's not complete because that would take far too long to go over. But it is going to give you a good picture of the progress that we've all made together. I should note also that none of this that you're going to hear today would be possible without the hard work of the, and the dedication of everyone in this incredible organization. So I want to say thank you to everyone at the TTC. Now, when I became the acting CEO in December of 2017, work was underway with new vehicle procurements, new facilities, and a customer experience focus. But I knew that we could do more, and I knew that we could do things better. You know, we needed to change the insular way of thinking and address the disconnect between what we were doing and what our customers needed or wanted. We had to tackle the fiscal challenges we faced with projects, capacity, and resources, and we needed to be nimble and respond to the changing industry landscape. Moving forward and addressing these challenges is, uh, is important to me because I believe that things that are good for the TTC and public transit generally are good for the city and the region that we serve. Now consider that the city of Toronto is the fastest growing city and fastest growing census metropolitan area in all of North America. Our diversity, our high quality of life, and our potential are being noticed around the world, and that's for good reason. The growth that we're seeing means that we have to expand our services to meet demand in a way that most transit systems don't have to do. And because of this, we're, doing, we're not doing things necessarily always the old way. We're looking to do things differently here at the TTC. We needed to get creative and continue adjusting our capacity to meet demand, something that you've heard me say since I joined this organization almost seven years ago. Our current five-year corporate plan was introduced to the previous board in January of 2018 and has guided this organization's priorities ever since. And I'll just remind you that the development of our next corporate plan will soon be underway 
with the time frame for board approval being January of 2023. Despite the challenges and emerging priorities that were faced over the last few years, the TTC has accomplished a lot in each of our key focus areas of the corporate plan. Now, I have a saying that I believe we are, we are a firm believer of working smarter and not harder in many cases, and transformation and building for the future are doing things differently and better, in other words, working smarter. Things like being fiscally responsible and, and maximizing our efficiency and protecting revenue, integrating systems with operations, and applying strategic approaches to planning and project management. And all of this is about ensuring our customers and employees feel welcomed and safe and that they're being treated with dignity and respect. So I'm pleased to report to the board that we, I believe this organization is working smarter and that's exactly what we're doing. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend about 20 minutes outlining for you where we, the board, our frontline employees and management have success thus far as well as our plans over the next 18 months. Excuse me. And I think you'll agree, there's a lot of great work has been done already, but there's an awful lot more to come. For me, it starts with our four key objectives, and they are to provide a safe, seamless, and reliable transit service, to be an inclusive and accessible service provider, and to transform to solidify our fiscal foundation and to innovate for future demand. And we use these key objectives as the foundation around our future planning. Now, many of you will remember, in 2018, it really presented challenges and opportunities almost immediately. We had a major service disruption in January, on January 30th of 2018 that resulted in significant overcrowding at Bloor Young Station. And I'm gonna speak a little bit more about this incident in, this, uh, in a few minutes when I talk about emerging priorities. Also in 2018, we renewed and we and strengthened our commitment to customers, employees, and community partners. We took advantage of the union's decision to reduce overtime, to hire more operators, and ultimately reduce our dependence on overtime, which is expensive and leads to workforce fatigue. I often tell people there's a saying in our industry, when you rely on overtime to get things done, things only get done in overtime, and we're stopping that. In September of 2018, we introduced runners directed trains for the first time in our subways, and we placed additional staff on platforms to expedite the movement of our service. And this really was a critical time for operations as we began to manage the subway differently. You know, other significant achievements you, you'll see up on the, on, up on the slide in 2018 that were approved at the, by the board this time were real meaningful and had an impact on the city and the service that we provide to our customers. Now I'm gonna to touch on emerging priorities a little bit and uh, the events that led up to the January 2018 crowding incident on line one, because it really revealed the vulnerability of our aging system, the urgency of our state of good repair and improved safety and reliability and system capacity. These events influenced the decisions that we needed from the board to set priorities for 2019 and beyond. And I'd say they also paved the way for us to get started on the Young Bloor expansion project and I'm thrilled that it's underway. And you saw that in one of the reports we have in front of you today. Now, as uh, for the 2018 corporate plan progress, we just have a, the highlights for you. And you can see we've made some significant advancements in each of the key focus areas in 2018. But now I'm gonna move on to 2019. You know, one of the primary accomplishments uh, was the release of the capital investment plan, a document that I'm incredibly proud of. It was the first major report of its kind presented to you for approval and laid the foundation of our capital work plans. In the CIP, we looked at our capital needs and undertook a comprehensive assessment of what was needed to accommodate growth-related projects and increase ridership, all while maintaining the TTC in a state of good repair. The result was a $33.5 billion 15-year outlook, which was designed for critical planning and future growth, as well as securing associated funding. And as a result, we were able to secure nearly an additional $5 billion just 11 months later through the City Building Fund, ensuring that we'd be able to do our essential work. And as you mentioned, Chair, as well, I'd like to uh, contribute the fact that the TTC works very closely with other levels of government, making them aware of our needs. And today's announcement was absolutely fabulous, but fantastic from our standpoint. And we welcome further discussion on the specifics on that announcement. 
I will tell you internally, we talk about what we need to do and we need to assess, we need to plan, we need to execute, and we need to get results. In 2019, we also introduced the early access program for the first time to conduct overnight subway maintenance. Along with more weekend closures, the TTC took advantage of the time to accelerate critical state of good repair infrastructure work. And we continue to build on that program, all with the intent of reducing closures in the future. As well in 2019, the TTC improved the way that we conducted business through internal restructuring, which resulted in a stronger strategic alignment within the organization and with our suppliers and partners. We also introduced commercial management with the restructuring of procurement materials management areas. And this will allow us to continue having very strong relationships again with our manufacturers, suppliers, and partners to advance our key priorities. Our project maturity and capacity capabilities have also improved as we conduct more stage gating for projects and they are better aligned with budgeting. An example of this would be in April of 2019, we brought a report to the board and we re-baseline the ATC project with a completion date of September 2022. And I'm pleased to tell you today that we're on target to do just that. Other accomplishments you approved in 2019 include developing plans and strategies like those on the board. You know, the board adopted the Toronto Action Plan to confront anti-black racism and endorsed the TTC's commitment to develop a system-wide anti-racism strategy. The board endorsed a revenue control strategy and work plan to improve fair collection and revenue protection activities. And I move on. And I'm not going to talk about each one on the, on the board. I'll just mention a few as they go along, but they're significant. You know, we established a transformation office and made progress on several initiatives while assessing where we can be more efficient elsewhere. We innovated through such programs as, as you recall, in June of 2019, we put the first e-bus in service on the 35 Jane route. We made permanent in April the King, King Street pilot program. And the board committed, committed support to the automated transit shuttle bus project with the City of Toronto and Metrolinx. And I'm pleased to report that it will be operational this spring in Commissioner McKelvey's ward in the Rouge Hill area. We also work closely with our uh, peers. As you recall, we hosted the APTA Rail Rodeo, and it was a conference in June of 2019. And it was a fabulous conference. Conference We had transit systems from all over North America and two from Japan here right, to celebrate and with the Rail Rodeo. But it's important, I also mentioned that we do a lot more with APTA, and peer reviews are very important in our industry as we work together to share best practices right, and help each other move forward with progress. And lastly, we're all very proud of that uh, Raptors Day Parade and the fact that the TTC moved a record 2.15 million customers. Now, you know, we closed out 2019 by retiring our old and unreliable streetcars. And I'm proud today to say that we have a neat streetcar network that is accessible in the city of Toronto. Now, I, I, earlier I mentioned our plans to combat racism and protect revenues. And I use these as examples of how we work with the city's accountability officers, like the Ombudsman and sit in the Auditor General, and they have helped the TTC to become more fair and inclusive while ensuring that we follow best practices and fiscal responsibility. And as you know, I've made diversity and inclusion an essential part of all that we do now and into the future. Finally, I have to acknowledge the significant change to the expansion projects that came in 2019. That year, the Toronto-Ontario Transit Partnership was formed, which came with a new understanding of our role in new transit projects and expansion. Through that agreement, the city retained ownership of the existing subway system, so I should say network, with the TTC continuing to operate it and retain fairbox revenues. The province assumed responsibility for construction and ownership of those projects. Now, with the province responsibility for expansion, the new arrangement really allowed the TTC to focus on its pressing capital needs. So again, as you can see, we've made uh, progress or advancements in each of the key focus areas of the corporate plan in 2019. Now, moving on to 2020, the year we'd all like to forget, and I can tell you I'm looking forward to the day we talk about COVID-19 in the past tense, but in the midst of the pandemic, we continued with an ambitious program of change while also adapting to the unprecedented operating impacts 
which I'm going to address in a moment. Here, and I'm just going to say here some of, for the first time, some of the accomplishments as well towards our five-year corporate plan. And again, I'll just mention a few of them. The 10-point action plan was unanimously endorsed by this board in December 2020, which represents the things that TTC can do in the short term to begin to affect positive change within this organization. We also brought forward the TTC's first five-year diversity and human rights plan. We called it Embrace Diversity, which looks at approaches the TTC is adopting over the long term. You know, we negotiated a new TTC Presto Settlement Agreement, reviewed governance and oversight, and under the direction of this board, we moved on our first five-year policy review. And there's a report before you today to address just that. As for easy access, we completed construction on six of the six additional stations, bringing the total number of accessible stations to 52 by the end of 2020. You know, on the Green Bus Program, uh, back in November of uh, 2017, the Green Bus Technology Plan was introduced to the board. And this really was an example of our commitment to innovation and sustainability that now makes the TTC a leader in the industry by operating the largest fleet of battery electric buses in North America. And I tell you, this couldn't be done alone. I think it's important that I, I note and say a special thank you to our partner, Toronto Hydro, for their participation and support in ensuring that we had the proper charging stations for our new fleet. So thank you them for that. Yes, for McNichol Garage, we completed the construction of our garage in 2020, and we welcome the opening of that garage next month. The board authorized the award of a Wheeltrans Reservation Call Center Overflow contract to implement a maximum wait time of two minutes, a significant improvement for our customers. In December of 2019, we came out with our first ever five-year service plan, and just 10 months later, in October of 2020, we implemented the Eglinton East Bus Priority Lane as part of the city's Rapid TO initiative, the first of several corridors proposed in the TTC's five-year service plan. Now, in November of 2020, we announced the completion of the fourth phase of ATC installation, with ATC signaling now covering approximately 75% of line one. You know, we launched a new information app for our employees to inform them of what's happening within this organization. And to date, almost 5,000 employees are users of this app. So a third of the organization is finding out their information. Right? That's fabulous, again, for our employees. You know, the board authorized uh, me to award a contract for asbestos abatement program, uh, taking advantage of low ridership to accelerate to steward a good repair work. And again, there's a report before you again today, so we can expand on, on with another recommendation to expand on that. But of course, the challenges that we face today related to COVID-19 pandemic remain among our most pressing for the immediate term. But despite ridership, being at a staggering lows this past spring, we continue to move 300,000 to 500,000 customers daily. So even with an 80 to 85% drop in ridership, this still equates to the seventh largest transit system during normal times in North America. That's a remarkable number of people that we moved even during those tough times. You know, I wanna say thanks to the unwavering commitment from our frontline workers, our maintenance staff, and our office and clerical workers, the TTC was able to play a pivotal role in providing essential transit services to our essential workers and the communities that, that are solely transit dependent. It was truly a case of essential workers moving essential workers. You know, I'd also like to, like to let you know that we continue to prioritize mental health support for our employees as well during these difficult times. <clears throat> 2020 corporate plan at a glance. And as you can see, we made a, a number of advancements as well in each of the key focus areas of our corporate plan in 2020. You know, even through 2020, the TTC remained a model of fiscal responsibility and a good steward of public funding. Before the pandemic struck, we had made fiscal sustainability a key feature of our five-year corporate plan because it is directly connected to our ability to fund what we need to do. But consider that, that between 2018 and 2020, we saved more than $140 million in our operating budget through efficiencies. Again, the focus there of providing a good quality service and being efficient. 
And these savings have allowed us to advance on our intergovernmental relations and secure funding for critical transit investment. Something else our customers will appreciate is our approach to regional coordination to create a seamless transit network across the GTA. The one bus, one fare concept is what all customers desire. We continue to work with our partners to make public transit more affordable and convenient. We need to remember that during normal times pre-COVID, 11% of our ridership comes from outside the city of Toronto. Commissioners, it's also worth mentioning that uh, you know, we've made good progress on our business objectives while putting out a safe and reliable service. We know this through our key monthly performance indicators, which are trending in the right direction. You know, these key KPIs really help us to continually improve because we all know what gets measured gets addressed. However, I, I have mentioned before that we are working on revising the uh, CEO report, and you'll see more when we introduce this to you in the April board report. So this now is going to conclude my review of achievements from 2018 to 2020. And once again, you can see the highlights up on the board. I, I think you'll agree that we've accomplished a lot together over the years, uh, but we need to focus on really what lies ahead of us because I'm, I'm going to get into that now, and there's an awful lot here. We know that the next 18 months will be critical as we complete the deliverables we've committed to in the current plan. We're now looking ahead at the balance of this year and into 2022 and how we can work together to achieve the following objectives. And I'm going to commit to you that the progress on these priorities will be addressed in future reports to the board, as well as within the CEO commentary. We also acknowledge that 2022 will be a short year as the end of the current board term will be upon us. During this time, we'll be in the process of developing our next corporate plan starting in July of 2022 with the intentions I mentioned earlier, proposing a plan to the board in, in January of 2023. So I'd like to break down the next 18 months for you in a number of key areas, demonstrating the volume of work that we have, a, we have ahead of us. We'll start with critical path number one, transform fiscal sustainability transformation initiatives. As part of the five-year corporate plan, we committed to addressing the gap between our revenues and our increasing needs and costs. And this includes advancing transformational and second sourcing initiatives and establishing clear timeframes and linkages to our budget. We also continue to prioritize overtime reduction strategies to manage our costs. We're gonna to continue to de develop and refine our asset management programs to be compliant with existing legislation by 2025. We continue to work on Presto to support the TTC's modernization efforts. And again, there's a report before you today outlining our efforts in this regard. We're gonna bring before this board a real estate investment plan shortly. And it's gonna be very similar to the capital investment plan, our CIP that I've mentioned, which helps us define short and long-term needs. We're gonna also revise our capital investment plan with an update and develop a new corporate plan and the focus of fiscal sustainability will remain. Now, now we'll move on to our, the, the uh, critical path to enable our employees to succeed. Diversity and inclusion. You know, as we advance on our diversity and inclusion initiatives, we're gonna continue to build capacity and recruit expert staff to build greater diversity and inclusion in both our workforce and in the delivery of our services. We'll also expand the TTC's cultural equity diversity, inclusivity by leading inclusive outreach, recruitment and training strategies and implementation. And as for succession planning, the process for building the leaders of tomorrow starts today. And that's why we remain committed to succession planning and leadership development. And this includes expanding our secondment opportunities, our mentoring programs and apprenticeships to build a stronger workforce. And I'd like to give you an example of, uh, of that last one because we remain focused on developing and implementing a rail technician apprenticeship program in partnership with Centennial College, the Ontario College of Trades, and Metrolinx to ensure that there is a level of education and qualifications for rail mechanics for city transit vehicles across this industry. Now, as for employee support and employee recognition and employee communications, you know, recognizing that our workforce is the backbone of the TTC, we're gonna to continue to celebrate employees for their contributions that they make every day. 
and we're going to ensure employees know what we are doing and why by leveraging existing technologies I mentioned earlier, the MyTTC employee app. Then moving on to critical path three, move more customers more reliably. Now operationalizing transit expansion projects becomes key. The budget go that goes before the council later this month includes resources necessary to hire and train staff for the opening of the Line 5 Eglinton Crosstown, the first new line in the city since Line 4 Shepherd opened in 2002. Now we do acknowledge the extension of Line 1 to Vaughan in 2017. We're also preparing for other expansion projects that are further out. And again, there's a report before you today on the agenda to address just that. Now, as for ATC installation, I've touched on that in the nickel bus garage. I've mentioned that a little earlier. But for, but for vehicle procurement, we continue to replace end-of-life vehicle assets to ensure a safe and reliable service. RFPs for new hybrid buses and possibly, I say, e-buses will be issued later on this year. And I'd let you know that a report on our e-bus pilot will be presented to you at the April board meeting. Moving on to critical path four, making taking public transit seamless. It goes back again to our state of good repair and our capital program. We'll continue to take advantage of the reduced ridership to advance our capital construction wherever possible. In our most recent budget, we advised that the amount of work that we have to do in the next 18 months, months is massive. It will be far more than we've done in the last two years and made possible by more early access and weekend closures. By the fall of 2022, we want the TTC to have the best service in the agency's history. To, and to get there, our focus will continue to be around delivering initiatives like ATC, the one-person train operation, while improving our safety and our reliability. As for easier access, 52 stations are currently accessible with four years left to ensure compliance with provincial legislation. By the end of 2025, all TTC stations will be accessible and we're all on target to do just that. The reset of the five-year uh, corporate plan, I'm sorry, service plan, recognizing the pandemic. You know, while demand for public transit has decreased due to the pandemic, we recognize that safe, accessible, and reliable public transit is critical to the recovery and prosperity of our great city. We're also advancing on service and fair integration issues, as I mentioned earlier. Now, as for customer and stakeholder communications, we will ensure that external communications to customers continues to support our corporate priorities and enhance their experiences on the TTC. Technology, traditional media outreach, improved wayfinding, partnerships and campaigns will all enhance these efforts. Now, it also includes prioritizing communications to critical stakeholders such as ACAT and Compto. We'll move on to critical path five to innovate for the long term, a green bus program. The TTC continues to work with Ontario Power Generation and Toronto Hydro on, arrange on arrangements to deliver the needed electrification infrastructure in tr in tr in, excuse me, infrastructure to transition our fleet to zero emission buses by 2040. And again, a report will be before you in April addressing just that. The automated transit pilot program I mentioned earlier, data uh, analytics, I'll mention that in, in the key performance indicators. The, uh, the greater our ability to analyze and understand and act on critical data, the more flexible and efficient we can be in meeting our customers' needs. You know, we're actually gathering new data and we're using our new systems like SAP and Vision and Maximo and more to improve our customers' experience. And I'd let you know we're coming along and we're doing better with that. As for the uh, cornerstone of uh, our business, safety and security, COVID, the COVID-19 recovery, we're going to continue to increase public confidence in transit by providing a demand response service while putting the safety of our customers and workforce first. First, I'm going to dry mouth, excuse me. We'll continue to work with the City of Toronto's Emergency Operations Center and the Toronto Public Health to ensure we have a consolidated response. As for safety action plans, this includes reintegrating emergency management and business continuity functions into the safety and environment department. We're gonna continue with working on second exits and ventilation upgrades and fo focusing on reductions on injuries and lost time. 
employees are our greatest asset and they should be protected protected and we're going to continue to put safety ahead of productivity as well our city building initiatives and partnerships will continue to be a priority for the TTC in 2021 and beyond. We will continue to work alongside key stakeholders to help support and deliver on the vision of the approved plans of the City of Toronto. And these include the Transform TO and Vision Zero, Modern TO, Connect TO, the City's Confronting Anti-Black Racism Plan and Poverty Reduction Strategy. Now, wrapping up, I'd say you can see that we've committed to a lot, we've accomplished a lot, and we have a lot more to do. I think you'll agree the TTC has proven itself to be an extremely agile and resilient organization. And despite the many challenges and, and emerging priorities over the last few three years, we continue to follow the five-year corporate plan. And uh, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, I want to make sure I, I say this again, that none of this could have been possible without the ongoing support hard work and dedication of the entire TTC family, all 16,000 women and men who work tirelessly to keep our system open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You know, as we look ahead into, as we look ahead into the future, 2020 has taught us that we can't always predict what lays ahead of us. We're going to continue to focus on what is known, and that is why we're laying out a set of deliverables that we believe will help us achieve your corporate objectives. We know we have an ambitious 18 months in front of us and we're moving full speed ahead while remaining committed to efficiency and fiscal sustainability. And it's not just about uh, the current corporate plan timeframe, as many of you have heard me tell you again, it's about the future as well. What we do today and the outlook is five, 15 and 25 years. So with that chair, I'd like to say thank you for your time and attention and let me do this presentation today. I'd like to thank this board for their support uh, and we work to make changes to make sure that the changes that will benefit our existing customers as well as those that we welcome in the decades to come. So thank you very much. Thank you very much um, to Rick Leary, our CEO, for that excellent presentation. And we will now take questions um, for for the CEO. So Commissioner Carroll will start. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, yes, Mr. Leary, I, I'm glad that you later focused on our the, what we are doing in terms of Black History Month inside the system for, for, for riders benefit. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, you touched on the incident that we had with a member of our staff, and I'm wondering if that could be reported back to us in the form of an item later on so that, that whatever measures are taken, we can check as a board as to whether or not we, we think there are enough uh, uh, into the future. Through you, Chair, I'd let you know, uh, uh, Commissioner, that when we report, when we uh, finalize the investigation, I will report back. But will, will you be reporting back as, a, as part of your CEO's report, or will it come back to us as an item, an actionable item? It, 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 recognizing it would be a personnel matter, I would bring it back in camera to this board. Oh, okay. It would come in camera, which makes it an item that we can take action on if need be. You may have taken all the, all the necessary actions, but it will be an actionable item in camera or otherwise. That's all I'm trying to. Yes. I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize. Commissioner. Yes. We'll make that an actionable item when we'll put a report for you. Thank you. Who is next? Sorry, um, was that Jeremy? me or? No, it was, uh, sorry, I had Commissioner Lai. She, yeah. Yeah, if, you could, if you could go ahead, Commissioner, and then we'll thank move you. to the Vice Chair. Thank you, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, uh, our CEO, for a really comprehensive report. And I just wanted to uh, ask a quick question. I, I understand that there is a, t a new TTC uh, direct bus service uh, on Steels Avenue into the Amazon site, uh, the fulfillment center in my ward. Would you have any bit of a, a little bit of an update on that one? How is it doing? And I don't think I see it in your report. Uh, through you, Chair, I can let you know, Councillor, it's going very well. If I could ask Mark Miss to give you a little bit more detail uh, since we've opened that service. Thank you. 
Uh, Kathleen, maybe you could take that if, uh, if Mark's not with us today. Yes, I'm afraid he's not with us. I think the good news story there is uh, that as soon as the need for transit service was identified in uh, Commissioner Lai's ward, uh, we were able to work really rapidly with our partners at the City of Toronto to get that service in, in there, modify it, find a way to make it work until the development can uh, catch up and provide all the uh, traffic control and, and pavement that we needed. So it was a real win. I understand that it, it's working well. And um, Commissioner Lai, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting how many employees it serves, but I know that it's in the hundreds anyway. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I commend your quick and prompt uh, service for, for these kind of arrangements. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, those are my questions. And we'll move to the Vice Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, to our CEO, thank you for that uh, very comprehensive report. I share um, um, Commissioner Lai's comment on that. It was absolutely uh, um, terrific. And it's good to be reminded of the wide range of projects and uh, initiatives that are in place. So my question to you is, you know, in any corporation, uh, the success of projects being executed uh, relies very much on um, the um, the fact that everything is aligned, that every unit, every or every part of the organization understands their role in um, the execution of these projects, understanding the, the scope of the projects and so on. So to what extent are you ensuring and each HR side of the organization is ensuring that embedded in the objectives of the management team and then flowing down into the operational level that these are understood and they're part of uh, their annual and uh, quarterly reviews. Through you, Chair, um, I would let you know that we spend a substantial amount of time having internal discussion at executive committees within this organization to address the interdependencies between projects to make sure that we're all well aware uh, and aligned as we move forward. I mentioned in the presentation about the stage gating impacts and what we're, what we're really focusing on in aligning it more with the budget. So we put a lot of effort in there. We're coming along very nicely. I remember at about a year ago, I was asked at the board, uh, you know, how I would uh, judge where we are. And, and we continue to make progress with our uh, maturity in that area. Um, okay, thank you. And, and is there, um... Is it tied, do you tie the um, execution to uh, performance reviews and therefore any increases in, um, in, in salaries and so on? I, I appreciate that we also have a, you know, um, a collective agreement and so on, but, but is there a, um, an attempt to tie um, execution with um, remuneration? That, that's correct. There's no uh, no salary adjustments based on uh, on this, but the focus for us is really working together so that we're all in the know to make sure that the execution and delivery is there, and we focus on that when uh, we do our annual reviews on what we're working on as a team. Okay, thank you. Um, next is Commissioner Jagio. You're next, five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, just speaking on the report that our CEO just gave, first and foremost, I, I'm a big believer that showcasing uh, Black Canadians who have been so supportive across the development of our country is so crucial. So I want to commend the TTC for doing that, um, especially around anti-Black anti racism, um, such an important element of what drives, I think, competitive advantage and diversity can be used as a competitive advantage. So as a Black Canadian, that makes me feel welcome and makes me feel good, as well as representation um, especially for those who use the transit. Um, I have some questions around assets um, and mostly, well, one question in particular around uh, looking back at 2020 and 2019, and then a question on some of the asset priorities. So I'll start with my first question on the past. Um, to our CEO, were, were there any interesting learnings around the implementation of the battery electric buses from an infrastructure perspective, as well as bringing that out um, to service? That's that's my first question. And then my second question is around asset management. Um, knowing that the TTC is a very asset heavy business, um, it's clear based on you know the balance sheet. What what are sort of some of the what, what are some of the plans around asset management? Are we thinking about using digital technology as a way to help streamline that? Are we thinking through artificial intelligence? Are we thinking through machine learning for for lack of using these buzzwords that are constantly thrown at us by academics? Have we thought through that? So I'll leave I'll leave those two questions with you to answer. 
All right, through you, Chia. No, thank you for the questions and thank you for the, uh, the the topic on the infrastructure for when it came to the new vehicles. One of the thank yous that I mentioned during my presentation was to really make sure that everyone's aware how much work Toronto Hydro did for us. All right, and making sure that the electrification systems were there. That was a significant amount of work at three separate locations. And the TTC uh, has incredibly talented individuals, but we just needed to bring some other experts in to make sure that we were ready. We're having some real successes there. I'm going to ask Bem Case if he's still on to give an update. We had a discussion earlier about the uh, the how the battery backup systems and how that was going to work. And if, Bem, if you could just give a quick update on that as well. What are your thoughts? Yes, through the chair, uh, thank you for that question. We've learned a great deal, in fact, um, about the implementation of uh, the capital delivery portion of that, as well as the organizational change that it, that is um, uh, required to adopt uh, what is a transformational technology. It changes not just the fuel that's used to power our buses, but it changes how we uh, plan the service itself, how we maintain the service, how we operate the service, et cetera. So, um, the report coming in April uh, will talk a, a lot about that. In fact, there are two reports in vision for April. One is specifically on the head-to-head -head evaluation and um, uh, between the three different manufacturers we have, and we, we plan to share uh, openly our uh, lessons learned uh, both on the, uh, the, the vehicle and the technology, but also to your point or to your question on what we've learned through the, the delivery. And we, we applied, as, uh, as uh, CEO Leary said, we applied a new delivery model, one that's new to us. It's truly uh, a partnership with Toronto Hydro. And we envision um, uh, going forward with that, um, that delivery model with OPG and Toronto Hydro going forward. And we'll, we'll put that forward to you in April. Excellent. Um, Josie will jump in on the next one, sir. So through the chair, um, our asset management plans are ones in which we're still, uh, as an organization, working through bringing clarity to our whole asset uh, inventory. Um, we are on a program through our own endeavors as well as through having to meet uh, provincial legislation by 2025 where we need to ensure that we have uh, asset management plans in place. So our focus has been really at the three levels. One is... Uh, clearly at the operational level as we're using technology to ensure that we have uh, asset management uh, capabilities, both from a, um, a maintenance plan perspective, as well as from a customer or sort of, uh, work order perspective and um, to get that kind of end-to-end um, -end process. Uh, we're also working at uh, the technology level, which is ensuring that there's integration across the organization. And we're also working at the corporate level to make sure that from an end-to-end -end perspective, we've got the capacity in place uh, for the business practices to support asset management. So SAP is part of this program, Maximo is part of this program, and the integration of our processes will be part of the program to define the data. Once we have that in place, Commissioner, we will then be using our technology to help utilize um, our capacity to assess what we need through our business intelligence capabilities. So that is part of the plan. Uh, the TTC is on that journey. Um, so we're not as far as machine learning, but we are making our aware our journey to that to that end. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and we've decided to shorten our lunch uh, hour to half an hour due to the um, the big agenda. And so we'll see everyone back at 1.05 uh, p.m. to uh, reconvene the meeting and, and restart the agenda. Thank you, everyone. So it appears that we have quorum, so we will um, 
reconvene our meeting and carry on with the CEO's report. Uh, we were on questions of uh, the CEO and we've accommodated some of those. Are there other questions for the CEO? Otherwise, we'll move to um, speakers if there's any speakers on this item. Okay, I don't, I'm not seeing any questions, um, so I'll move to speakers. Um, is there anybody who'd like to speak on this item? I'd like to say a few words, but uh, Commissioner Carroll, why don't you go first? Sorry, I was already unmuted. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, uh, Chair. It, it was great to see the progress report, to see uh, to see where we're getting in terms of the work plan, and to know that uh, that that there's confidence that that we can proceed with it despite all that has gone on in 2020, and and so that will be something for all of us to to uh, continue to to monitor. Uh, the comes after the the report was written is is more good news i asked my question earlier though on the incident and that it be an item because i think it's really important that we look at this uh both from the the uh the the situation of uh you know a staff member doing what what appears to have happened during black history month we have to we have to ensure as board members that there's a zero tolerance to that and so we want an item that looks at the action uh, but we i think we also have to uh, in a standing item alone ask what the training is going forward ask how we're making it at uh, how we're how we're really making a difference in this regard not only teaching there is a zero tolerance to this but how are we going to go on to teaching pride in the fact that we take this giant public asset and use it to be a major component in in all of the materials that are spread throughout the community during Black History Month. And so I, I think that it's an actionable, uh, actionable item is really important. We may want to enhance whatever I know the CEO is already planning in this regard. I know he takes it seriously, but should we want to enhance it? That's my reason for looking forward to seeing the, the, uh, the consequences post action coming back to us. Thank you. Other speakers on this item? I, I don't have any, but um, if, you, if you quickly put up your hand, I'm happy to. The problem is I can't see everybody in one fell swoop here. So, okay, I'm not seeing anybody. So I'm just going to thank the CEO, Rick Leary, for this excellent presentation. I thought it was off the charts, succinct, clear, wonderful highlights of the past three years and then looking ahead the next two and I think it's very exciting where this uh, I want to say institution because it is one I'm, it's very exciting where this institution is going and our CEO has steered this organization through unprecedented challenges including you know a major reliability uh, issues uh, that we face almost daily because of aging infrastructure the uh, Toronto Ontario Transit Agreement, that was no small feat and will continue to be challenging. And of course, uh, the big bad topic of all is COVID-19. So even in midst of a, a global pandemic, our CEO's presentation shows that we're making impressive progress on a number of important initiatives. And I just wanna take a moment to, on behalf of the board to, to thank Rick and his executive team for their steadfast leadership and for continuing to push forward with ambition and uh, far-reaching programs that will leave a lasting a legacy, a lasting impact on this organization. So one of the most, um, I think, exciting initiatives that uh, Rick has led is the 15-year capital investment plan. And I know a, a number of executive members have worked on this with him hand in hand. And that initial number, none of us will ever forget it, was burned into our minds into our brains, 33.5 billion in capital needs, 23.7 billion, which were unfunded. And um, in the two years since the report launched, the conversation has changed and the state of good repair is now on the table in every conversation. And I think it's because of that unprecedented document that was presented to us at the beginning of this term. 
it really, I think people were a little bit nervous about that document, anxious about it, but boy, has it set the scene and uh, really given us something to chew on and to try to course correct. So um, I know I've had conversations with other levels of government, with uh, residents, with members of the public uh, on this, and um, it's wonderful. Expansion is great. Can't talk enough about expansion, but we cannot let our core system fail in, and fall into disrepair. I mean, we can never forget, you know, expansion is sexy. Disrepair is not. It, 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 you know, the system as it stands, the current system, not as exciting to talk about a state of good repair. So I really credit Rick and his team for bringing this conversation to the forefront. I mean, honestly, there's, a, there's so many things I could highlight today, but I think that document was um, really a, a, a shift and transform, transformational in itself. Um, even though, you know, people were nervous about seeing those numbers on paper for the very first time above and below the line. So financial sustainability has become a focus for the TTC. I heard him say it is important to be good stewards of public funds uh, more times than I can count. And our mission is really to run an efficient, effective, integrated transit system that better serves the residents of our city. And any delivery model that will achieve that, I'm going to get fully behind. Um, you know, we're also looking to be more innovative and more dynamic and more nimble and more agile and, and adaptive to changing circumstances. Our CEO and his team are leading initiatives to modernize and transform this organization. And one of the things I'm most excited about is the e-buses. Uh, we now have nor the, 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 in North America, we have the largest mini fleet of e-buses and we're considered industry leaders on this on this frontier. So a lot of us were at that um, that launch, and it was very exciting and continues to be uh, the work that's happening on e-buses. That's something that I'm ex very focused on. I also just want to quickly mention diversity and anti-black racism. This has become a top priority for this organization. As I've said before, I don't ever speak to Rick without him bringing that up and highlighting the work that's being done. And it's very ambitious and challenging, um, but I think we're gonna see real change in this organization as a result of the leadership on this issue. Um, so just in wrapping up, we have a number of challenges ahead in the next two years. I don't have to tell you that, but I'm confident in this plan our CEO has laid out for us today and to continuing advancing our key organizational priorities, focusing on financial stability and financial sustainability and service reliability, innovation, employee success, and providing seamless and integrated transit service and safety. So thank you very much to our CEO for this uh, very wonderful presentation today. And um, uh, I think it, you did a great job, Rick, and the presentation was um, really impressive. So thank you very much. And on that note, I will ask, I will move a motion to adopt uh, this item. All in favor, opposed, that carries. Okay, so um, my marching orders here are that we're supposed to address item four and item seven, um, and that is um, state of good repair, delegated authority. We did take action in camera on that one, and um, there are staff recommendations before us. So I believe... Um, to the clerk, I believe that there was a request for a recorded vote on this. Uh, so I just want to get clarity around that. I guess I should pass the baton to you if it's a recorded vote. Thank you, Chair. I'll ask that the motion be posted on the screen. Commissioner Carroll requested a recorded vote on this item. On the motion before you, calling the question, Commissioner Bradford. Oh, sorry, Chair Robinson. No, no, I was okay. just putting, I was voting. I was excited. Okay. To vote. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Commissioner Bradford. Favor. Thank you. Commissioner Carroll. I can't see her right now. I'll move on and come back. Commissioner De Laurentiis. In favor. 
Commissioner Jag Jagdeo? In favor. Commissioner Lai? Favor. Commissioner Lowland? In favor. Commissioner McKelvey? Favor. Commissioner Minimong? Aye. Commissioner Osborne? In favor. Commissioner Ro Chair Robinson? Hello, Madam Speaker. Oh. In, in favor. And Madam Commissioner Speaker. Carroll? Madam Speaker, I have been locked out of this meeting. It disconnected on me. I had questions on this item. <laughs> Okay, can Sorry, I just ask speaker, I, the tech difficulties are not my own. Okay, can I just ask the clerk to clarify on this just clarify on this request? So the motion before the board is uh, to adopt the action taken in camera. The in camera motion that was put before the board. Commissioner Carroll, do you have questions on the motion or the item specifically? No, I have questions on the item. Okay. Yes, I have questions on the item. I became disconnected somewhere in the middle of uh, Commissioner Robinson's speech on the CEO's report. I have been trying ever since then to reconnect. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, we're we're on. Just so everybody's. I, I, I sent you an email to that effect, letting you know that I was locked in. I just I just actually received that email, Commissioner. Okay, so just to be clear for everybody's uh, sake, uh, we're on item four, state of good repair, delegated authority. We're kind of in the middle, middle of a vote, but we'll, we'll cap, we've captured that information and um, we'll just go back to questions. Um, questions, uh, Commissioner Carroll. I'm sorry, but my first question is what voice vote? Are we, we are still planning on taking, a, you mean by that a recorded vote? Yeah. You understand we were okay. in the middle of a recorded vote because you had made that request. Okay. Yes, yes, I'm just verifying that. Thank you. I, I'm sorry for the I I'm sorry for the, the technological difficulties. I don't know why, but I'm having a great deal of difficulty hearing this morning, uh, throat in camera. Um, my questions on this item are we are about to uh we are about to uh, take a vote on an item and a motion. I'm wondering if staff could uh, could uh, give us an indication of when the information we are voting on will become public. Through the chair, the contract's due to be voted on on or around the 8th of March. And at that time, uh, the award itself will become public and the actions taken by this board. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Councillor. Are you talking about the the additional motion or the actual work? So once the uh, the award oh, becomes I'm known, I'm talking about both. I'm talking about the award itself and all of the actions that this board is about to take. So at, at that juncture, so I'm going to uh, defer to Chris on the on the motion part. As soon as we know what the uh, when the bid comes in, we will make it public that we'll be uh, doing the work at St. Patrick from the time frame. Uh, would you make let me know on the motion? Through the chair, with respect to the motion, any information on any uh, contract awards would be made public, provided that contracts are indeed awarded. There's no contracts that have been put out at this time. Um, and and since there are no terms in the in the motion, the additional motion in this item, is there a reason why that needs to remain confidential? It doesn't really square with the other things that are public about our capital plan. So I'm wondering why that would have to remain in camera. Through the chair, the information that's remaining in contract is the delegated authority upset limit should we choose to exercise an additional contract award. Because that would um, that could influence our ability to negotiate with the contractors. Okay, so the action taken could become public, but the the upset limit must remain confidential. Correct. Okay, thank you. I'll ju I'll just comment on it briefly, Madam Chair. Well, because I don't think we have anybody uh, any other speakers. Thank Go you. ahead. I just want I just wanted to clarify for the board members. There is a lot of chatter going on about this item in the transit community. 
amongst uh, uh, you know transit watchers, the 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 bargaining unit themselves. And so I am verified because I am going to be voting against this. I'm verifying when it will be public because I I don't wish to put myself in any situation. Uh, the chatter is already going on, and I wanted to make clear when everything we've done is public, so that when when they do start talking about it, it doesn't come back to me. I don't intend to divulge anything, but it it will reach the public domain, and I wanted to be quite clear about when that will happen. Thank you. Those are my comments. Thanks, Madam Chair. So now we'll just return to the, I think we were almost through um, the recorded vote, but I'll hand it back to the clerk. Through the chair, we'll, uh, we will begin the recorded vote again. I'll ask that the motion be put forward, given that we didn't complete the recorded vote. So the motion before you is um, with respect to the motion that was made in camera, we will vote separately on the staff recommendations. Um, Commissioner Bradford. In favor? Commissioner Carroll. Opposed? Com uh, Vice Chair De Laurentiis. In favor? Commissioner Jagdio. In favor? Commissioner Lai. Favor. Commissioner Lalonde. In favor? Commissioner McKelvey. Aye. Commissioner Osborne. In favor. Chair Robinson. In favor. The motion carries on a vote of nine to one. Okay, we're going to move on to the next item. Um, oh, sorry, that Chair, was, just to, we sorry, just need to vote sorry. on the staff recommendations. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, go Two ahead. Yeah. To so, vote on, please. Yeah, that's correct. My apologies. So, staff, now before us are staff recommendations which were up on the screen a minute ago. So the recommendations contained in the staff report is, um, Commissioner Carroll, are you requesting a recorded vote on this as well? Just to clarify. Yes? That's correct. Okay. On the That's staff correct. recommend. Yep, on the staff recommendations, Commissioner Bradford. Favor. Uh, Commissioner Carroll. Opposed. Commissioner De Laurentiis. In favor. Commissioner Jagdio. In favor. Commissioner Lai. In favor. Commissioner Lalonde. In favor. Commissioner McKelvey. In favor. Commissioner Min and Wong. Commissioner Min and Wong. Sorry about that. I didn't put on my mic. Aye. Commissioner Osborne. In favor. Chair Robinson. In favor. The staff recommendations carried on a vote of nine to one. Okay, now we're ready to move on to item seven uh, for a quick release on large litigation matters. I think um, everything was resolved in that uh, earlier session. So um, if I could get a, a motion to adopt staff recommendations. Motion Council, to staff recommendation. So Commissioner Bradford, uh, moving that, all in favor? Sorry, sorry, Madam Speaker, I'm sorry to be problematic, but the, the, the system problems are such that I was disconnected. Did we did we set aside item number five for later? I must have missed that when I was having my problems with connection. Yes, we, we did. We set that aside. That's still oh. coming. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so all those in favor of item seven, large litigation matters, opposed, that carries. Okay, now we go back to item two, the approved minutes of the Advisory Committee on Accessible Transit. And I just um, want to introduce our new chair, Igor, um, and welcome him, him officially on behalf of the board. So as you will recall at our last meeting, Amazon stepped down. Igor has stepped into his place, and uh, we're very happy to see you here today. Um, for those of you who don't know, Igor has actually been an ACAP member since January 2019. Uh, he, was also, he also served in the pool member uh, since 2018, so, um, and he worked on the design review subcommittee, if you weren't aware of that. Uh, he's worked at the University of Toronto for more than five years, while also completing his graduate degree, 
For the past three years, Igor has served as vice chair of the board of directors for students for barrier free access, actively involved in projects dealing with the accessibility services at U of T and accessible U of T websites. He is part of the Student Move TO project that redefines accessible transit in the GTA within a student context. He also has spearheaded the accessibility liaison team at the U of T in advocating for students with accessibility needs. On behalf of the TTC board, we're looking forward to working with you and your new vice chairs, Debbie and, and Christy, uh, who were also newly appointed at our last meeting. So I just want to, on behalf of the board, congratulate you all, welcome you. Uh, we're looking very forward to our continued work and I will now turn it over to Igor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Chair Robinson. So good afternoon. Uh, commissioners, I'd like to congratulate uh, everyone on their appointment state cap for the 2021 year. I'd also like to introduce, as Chair Robinson said, the 2021 state cap vice chairs, Debbie Gillespie and Chris Stegas, and myself, Igor Samarzik, as the chair. I'm honored to have the opportunity to serve as the 2021 ACAT chair and look forward to working with so many talented individuals at the TTC. I'll be presenting several highlights from the last two ACAT general meetings that took place in November and December. The first highlight is regarding e-scooters and e-bikes. There's a growing concern by ACAT that these devices have become a safety concern. It's been reported that many times these devices are operated and left on TTC properties in a manner that is an impediment to accessibility. ACAT has passed a motion and is of the mindset that this is a safety issue for customers with disabilities, seniors, and pedestrians near and on TTC properties. The second highlight I'll be referring to is regarding the Wheeltrans self-booking website, which has been updated recently with several new features that makes the system more user-friendly and responsive to the needs of customers. We've also seen an improvement to the average speed of calls answered by Wheeltrans reservationists, Average speed in the reservation queue has decreased. A new contract with Talus Communication, as folks might be aware of, began at the end of November to handle overflow calls um, with the goal of speeding up calls from 15 minutes to two minute wait times. Third highlight um, that I want to draw your attention to is regarding the Young Tomorrow project. Back in December, members received a presentation on Young Tomorrow, which was approved on February 3rd by Council. ACAT members expressed significant concerns with the accessibility of the design, including the disruption to the 97 Young bus from serv serving a portion of the route. City staff um, took back our recommendations and suggestions. We're looking forward to working with them in the future. And finally, my fourth highlight, having reviewed the seven meter Pro Master Pilot vehicle, ACAT endorsed the approval directing staff to proceed with the procurement of the production vehicle subject to final configurations of several outstanding items. Um, those are all the highlights from those two meetings. I look forward to working with the TTC board, the CEO Rick Leary and his team, and all the members of ACAT in continuing to prioritize accessibility in 2021. The next ACAT meeting is on February 25th, 2021 via WebEx. As always, commissioners are welcome to attend. Thank you all for your time. I'm having a bit of trouble with unmuting. Okay, so that was excellent, Igor. Uh, congratulations on your very first uh, speech and remarks. Very clear and very helpful and insightful. Uh, we do have a question for you from Commissioner uh, Carroll, followed by Commissioner Denzelman and Wong. Uh, yes, hi, uh, hi, Igor. Um, congratulations, by the way. Um, Thank you. I'm wondering if you could uh, uh, just tell us a little more about the e-scooter difficulty, because this is kind of a live item for City Council. Um, what are the difficulties? Is it a matter of where people are parking privately owned ones, or, or, or what, what's the exact issue so that we don't make it worse when the, the city goes back to looking at this item? Sorry, uh, Commissioner Carroll, can you just repeat the first part? What was 
the subject well, matter. You, you said you said that you had a problem with the 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 or the the ACAT members have a problem with, with e-scooters. Yes. And particularly around the entrances to transit stations, is it a matter where people with privately owned ones are locking them or? We just don't want to make it worse when the city looks at a, a possible e-scooter share program. Yes, my understanding from feedback uh, from members on this issue is that e-scooters and e-bikes, um, folks are riding them on TTC property or seem to be using them or parking them on parts of sidewalks. And therefore, um, it prevents individuals who maybe use mobility devices or wheelchairs, et cetera, from being able to navigate the public realm when these devices are, uh, when these devices take up room in the public realm. So I think it's a case by case situation, but overall, generally, there seems to be more of these devices in use. And yeah. in terms of how they're sort of, I guess, housed or parked is still um, up for discussion. And it's not very clear what the policy or regulation is in regards to that. So we're yeah. identifying, we're flagging that as a potential issue that we see foresee in the future with regards okay. to this. Okay, so that's that's really important to, uh, for us to do going forward. And the one other thing, if you don't mind, the, um, the, the concerns with Young Tomorrow, I'm wondering if ACAT is um, working in conjunction with the city's own um, uh, you know, accessibility committee because the, the local councillor of most of the young uh, tomorrow area chairs that committee. So that would be a really good synergy. Is that is that happening? Um, I think it's happening to some degree, but I think if there are opportunities that maybe you have in mind or that staff could um, take note of that can potentially connect ACAP with that committee or strengthen those. Uh, relationships, I think that would be incredibly beneficial as well with the city of the local city councilor. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Next is Commissioner Minnan Wong. Yeah, thanks. Um, just on the e scooter thing, um, are you aware that the city is currently contemplating a, a pilot project? No, I'm, I'm not aware, Commissioner. Okay, so uh well I, I i guess so the pilot project would be a smaller project um uh and it would go through the it's it's kind of being contemplated through the infrastructure and environment committee so have you been, no one at acat's been consulted on this i would refer to ttc staff if we might have in the past i don't want to speak to say that we haven't. There are four subcommittees. We receive reports all the time and updates from TTC staff. So this might have been something that was presented through an update and therefore uh, the reason why ACAT sort of talked about it and presented a motion was because of the nature of that. So I think I'm gonna assume that you are correct. It was presented to us probably at one point. Okay, um, and is your concern, because so I heard you say you're concerned about you know where they're parked, is that sort of the, main concern or, or or do you have a broader concern with regard to the um the operation of the of the e-scooters i i think one of the concerns that came out was example for example cities like san francisco have e-scooters that folks are able to leave um just parked anywhere yeah, within a certain area and so that type of um parking situation of leaving it i think is um the biggest sort of concern that members might have had. I can get back to you if there are any others, but off the top of my head, that is what comes to mind. So on my right, on the kind of virtual Hollywood squares is um, Councillor McKelvey. She's chair of the infrastructure committee. You might want to connect with her um, because her committee that she chairs and I'm a member on, um, she'd probably be interested in some of the concerns you might have. I know that's not a question, but, uh, um, I had the opportunity so to connect both of you too. So there, I've done it. Thank, Thank you. Very much. We can reach out and connect with each other following this movie, uh, sorry, movie, <laughs> following this motion. Uh, it feels like a movie after you said Hollywood Squares. Um, following this uh, this motion, this item, and, and have a more fulsome discussion. So I look forward to that. Thank you. Thanks.
I think um, Commissioner Osborne would also like to ask a question or questions. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Hi, Igor, and congratulations. Um, I just wanted to clarify that there are a couple of levels of the um, uh, the e-scooter issue, which Councillor Min and Wong alluded to, but one of them, if I'm not mistaken, is that ACAT would like e-scooters and other equivalents to be treated like bicycles on TTC property. So there are other circulation issues, I think, but is, is that correct? That seems accurate to me. Okay. You're, you're right about that. Yes, I believe so. Thank you. Thank you. Is that's that, all. Did I you have. have anything else, Commissioner Osborne? That, that's it for me. Thank you. Okay. And I think I, I think I'm right in saying, um, JDO, do you have a commissioner? Do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question, Chair. Go thank ahead. You. Uh, Igor, um, thank you for joining us today. Again, wonderful, and it's great to see you appointed to your chair position. I, I want to move away from micromobility for a second and ask a couple questions around the self-booking website. So whenever whenever I think about an apps or technology, my mind all automatically goes into product management mode. Um, and though we've seen some pretty incredible highlights, for example, the booking time is moving down from 15 to 2 minutes, there's always going to be room for improvement. Um, has ACAT or any of your peers thought through where some of the new or where some improvements could come from, given the success we already have, but obviously moving forward and the desire to always be in a constant state of improvement where those um, improvements could be sought? With To clarify, Commissioner, is it with specifically with regards to the self-booking website or is it regarding the time management, moving it down or... Uh, let's start with the self-booking website, and I, I think likely all of the other derivatives come under as a module. Um, to be honest with you, there are, I'm sure ACAT, ACAT, generally speaking, always has suggestions and comments and feedback to um, the TTC, uh, and I'm sure there are countless uh, ideas and suggestions that folks have on improving the system. I know the TTC has responded quite well in making as many improvements as um, as they're able to um, in the last little while. And I believe we received uh, quite a thorough update from all the improvements in terms of efficiencies and user experience and interface that had been completed and brought online uh, in November and December. So I don't know them off by heart, but um, I'm sure uh, either myself or through TTC staff uh, an update can be provided more wholesomely of what those items were. Um, but generally speaking, um, I think to your question around uh, reducing the wait time, I think we've seen quite a drastic improvement. And I think with the new TELUS communications contract um, and outsourcing some of that help to other individuals, I think that'll continue to reduce the time uh, that folks uh, are waiting. Um, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, I just have a couple questions. Can you just, um, Igor, just expand a bit on, um, the initiative that, um, council approved the EA, uh, the, the, um, young Toronto, I'm sorry, young tomorrow. What was it? Young tomorrow, I think, but anyway, you know what I'm talking about. You mentioned it. Um, and the 97 young street bus, um, can you just expand a bit? So we're fully aware of your concerns. Yeah, so the, um, I think generally speaking from a very high level, um, when it comes to street design and redesign, I think um, the city and um, pursues that in a very um, traditional method. And I think with regards to accessibility, ACAT is really challenging the way that we sort of design and see the way that streets are built out. And I think there are opportunities to work collaboratively collaboratively together um, with ACAT with city staff to start at the beginning of that process um, from the design conception to final implementation to implement some interesting ideas and ways of um, looking at streets that hasn't sort of been done before. So that's what I'll say with regards to that. I think a lot of this has to do with bike lanes and curbs and curb cuts. Um, curb cuts are really 
a really important part of real estate for folks with accessibility needs because of ramps that are deployed, et cetera. Um, and those curb cuts are um, in conflict many times with bike lanes. So I think if there is an opportunity to work together um, with biking advocates, as well as the city in terms of how do we mitigate some of those tension points, um, I think that could be a potential solution for future um, redesign of streets. Um, in regards to the 97 Young Bus, this was brought up by one of our members, Craig, um, from our design review subcommittee. Um, the 97 Young Bus obviously serves a portion of Young, and that would, would need to be rerouted, I believe, through TTC staff. I don't know if they want to comment on that. Um, and there are folks with accessibility needs that use that bus, or so that was the nature of the comment. And so we just need to think of how that'll work in regards to rerouting that route and what that would look like for folks who are essentially displaced to a certain extent uh, with regards to a route that they're um, used to. Okay. And are you aware at the council meeting last week, I moved a motion on the item that was before us called Active TO. And I moved a motion specific to ACAT and ensuring that there is ongoing consultation, not just one stop shopping, but ongoing consultation with your organization are you aware of that no i'm not but i'm happy to hear about that and i okay. welcome it i think it's great okay I, i'm gonna i'm gonna flip you the motion uh later today okay you, you're welcome uh good work today and i request a motion to receive the acap minutes uh counselor or commissioner mckelvey uh, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. We're moving to item three now, which is liquidated damages for the supply of additional streetcars from Bombardier Trans Transportation Canada Limited. And we'll start with questions. Uh, if there's, uh, Councillor Carroll has questions, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if, uh, if uh, uh, staff would like to to give us any update on this, because this this sort of finalizes a contract that that was before the community in, in public earlier to, to order the 13 cars. And so we looked at some things in camera that finalized that. But I'm wondering if staff wanted to take this opportunity to update whether or not there is potential in the federal announcement this morning uh, to to uh, expand the the, uh, the the order before us now. Was there any talk of vehicle purchase being the use for that? What was it 3 billion, 13 billion, whatever it was? Through you, Chair, I'll handle that, Councillor. Uh, we've continued to have discussions with uh, multiple levels of government regarding what the TTC's needs are. And in those discussions, it, it's a two to be determined. You know, we, we were hoping that the announcement this morning, this morning would be a little bit um, more fruitful with information, but we will continue those discussions with them. Oh, we, but so we, we don't have that answer for you right now. I don't have the specifics. So we did, he, they didn't get specific. Okay. And if from what you know of the conversations we have with them, re, I recall when, when we did this, this order, they told us that that they were going to extend to us a pricing that that really is commensurate with with ordering the larger amount. If if we were to to if we if we were to finalize this this order of thirteen cars, and we were able to say that we would be able we would be in a position with funding to take delivery in twenty twenty six. That's the the year this this these federal dollars are to flow. Um, would uh, would they be? Do you, do you know whether or not they'd be able to extend that price to us if we if we if we had the order with that that time frame in it? Bim, I'm going to ask you to give a little update on the time frame. I can tell you the discussions that I've had with them that uh, through Bombardier and in Alstom more recently is the fact that uh, they're giving us a period of six months to make sure that other levels of government can partner with us, and oh, that through economies okay. of scale, the price per vehicle goes down significantly. Uh, right. with the more that are ordered. So that's why I'm right. looking forward to more discussion on the in today's announcement. Yes. Okay. Do you want to wait then rather than have uh, rather than have them take a guess, do you want to wait and you'll update us next month? <laughs> oh, absolutely. So the, as soon as we find out some information, we'd make sure that the board was aware. Okay. I'm hoping that we have enough detail within those six months to take advantage of that because it would be it would be a shame for all three levels if we can't and really a shame for the system since it, it will start running out of streetcars right about there. 
No. Okay. Thanks. Is there any other um, commissioners that would like to ask a question on this item? I don't have anybody on my file here, so I'm going to assume not. And any speakers on this item? Okay, we're good, I think. Shout out if we're not. But uh, so then we just need a motion to adopt the staff recommendations that are noted in the report. Uh, that's going to Commissioner, our new Commissioner, Jay Dio. Okay. And um, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. Now we're moving to item five, which I believe uh, Commissioner Min and Wong had held. It's Presto Fair Policy, everybody's favorite topic. And of course, collection strategy update. So we'll start with questions of staff. Uh, Commissioner Denzel Minawong, you have the floor as you held this item, if you would like, or you Thanks. might just want to speak, I don't know. Um, oh, questions, we're doing questions. So I, I wanted to ask questions with regard to the, you know, RFI or RFP that's out on the street. When, is, has it back yet? Has it closed? Through you, Man, An Angela, could you take that or Kathleen? Angela would be great. Thank you. Through the chair, the RFI has closed on Friday, uh, February 5th. And February 5th. So that's just, that's pretty fresh. Yes. Um, um, last week. Um, how many, uh, how many people uh, submitted proposals? Through the chair, we've, we've received 21 submissions. Uh -huh. I can't go into the details of all of the suppliers that have uh, submitted through the RFI, but um, it's it's been very, um, very good, very very fruitful for us. Okay, and um, and uh, is that list of the people that filed? Is that a is that something that we can get? So through the chair, it's our intention to at our at at the May board uh, meeting to present the findings and the learnings from the RFI as well as, as well as the peer review. So, and that will also include all of the submissions that we've received um, in terms of who's been able to uh, to submit to the RFI process. So we, it's our intention to share that with you. So will that. Um... So what you know? How what does that look like? The findings is that in terms of have you asked about price? Have you asked about technology? You know, what is it that you're going to present? Through the chair, the the intention of the RFI process is to understand the technologies that are available to to us as a as a transit agency, also the innovations that are happening as well as how we could, how do we tr transition from the closed loop um, smart card system that we have today to a more sophisticated fair collection system? Well, did, did any of them, in terms of um, the proposal, did you ask any financial information about how to do that? No, the, the, the RFI is not asking about financial um, a proposal right now because we are still in the exploratory stage where we're looking at what is the kind of technologies available and then um, we will be able to also have a conversa conversations with peer agencies to understand how it's been applied in the marketplace. So this is a very early stage conversation that we've been having with the suppliers. And if, it, it, you know, once you get those um you know that analysis done and you present it to the commission will that form a framework for putting out a uh, an rfp the purpose of the rfi is twofold it is for us to understand what kinds of technologies will best suit um our uh, our agency it will it's it's part of the larger discussion that we're doing with the the fair collection and the fair policy and as well as it's gonna input into the Presto um, RFP process. So it's a bit early for us to determine whether or not it, it's going to be able to help um, inform a, a more detailed RFP, but it, it, that's the intention. Sorry. So we, yeah. I, I'm sorry, it's a little, I'm struggling a little bit with the language. A Presto RFP, I've never heard of that before. Wouldn't it just be an RFP? Well, pressed. So there's there's lots of um, things happening all at the same time. So the first thing that's happening is Presto is reprocuring for their supplier in 2022, 
And so the information that we are seeking with our RFI is going to help us better inform what requirements that we need as part of their process. It will also provide us with a lot of intelligence as to what we need to be doing um, when our um, agreement with Presto ends in 2027. So it's really helping us on multiple fronts so that we can really understand and get the business requirements that we need, one from Presto and two, um, when our contract ends with Presto in 27. But notwithstanding, you know, consequences or implications from that meeting, we could decide if, if there are other options out there that we could do our own RFP with no obligations attached to, well, we could get submissions in with no obligations that we'd have to take any of those submissions. Is that fair to say? Well, yes, we, through this process, this has been, um, the RFI has just simply asked the, the marketplace what technologies are available to us. It has, there's no obligation for us to pursue a formal RFP with this process. If but we, we could if, actually, if we wanted to, we could go, we could decide that we would want to go it alone ourselves. If that's the, the board's decision. Right. Kathleen's, were you going to? Uh, that's all I was going to say through you, Madam Chair, just to say if the board directed us to do it, just as they did with the RFI, then of course we would carry on. Um, we're looking to see how much we can learn from the RFI, uh, present it to the board, and then see if there are any other gaps between RFI learnings and RFP, like putting an RFP out. Could we look at doing a vendor day? Yes. Do you like that idea? Would that be like a commercially confidential conversations that are, are curated by procurement uh, staff? Let's ask vendors to come in and show them show show their stuff. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I suppose we would do it virtually as we do now. So it would be. Um, I mean, I've done it a bunch of different ways, but uh, we could certainly design something that allows vendors to uh, demonstrate for us uh, whether they do it together or whether they do it singly, whether it's considered commercially confidential. We could do all of that. Okay, thanks. I think I went one over time. Thank you. Yeah, much. yeah just by a few seconds. Uh, Commissioner Carroll is next. So, uh, I, I have a bunch of governance questions, but if I could just uh, follow up uh, on uh, Commissioner Min and Wong uh, with Angela. So if I can just put that in layman's terms, we're doing our own request for interest. The, the, the province, well, Metrolinx, I should say, uh, their RFP is almost simultaneous. So um, it, it, does the timing align such that we have our own go it alone possibilities, but, but does the timing align such that we would also have the ability to look at whether or not they are seeking to resolve some of the, the performance and functionality issues through the results of their own RFP. We'd be able to compare and contrast before making a decision. Through the chair, exactly. That's exactly what we've, we've been doing with our time in, um, with their process to ensure that we can, first of all, get the, re the business requirements that we've been asking for and to be right. able to also get the, the modernized uh, fare collection system that we desire through their process first. And then if uh, then we have alternatives and we've identified that um, in our critical path in, in the report that if, if we need to um, be independent. Okay. And then if I could, that, that, that brings me to the governance piece because these uh, this sort of three tiered advisory structure begins to uh, matter uh, very much. Now we were told this morning that we can ask questions about this governance system in public, yet they're on the purple pages. But so can I just clarify? Once we adopt this item, is this whole governance structure going to be made public once we've voted on it? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, the governance structure was approved in public in the September board meeting. Oh, so I can just, it was just a matter of convenience that it's on purple pages. I can just assume that it's, I can talk about it. It's wide open. Yes, it's because it was incorporated into the settlement sheet and that was included as an attachment. Okay, way to make me paranoid, Kathleen. <laughs> so, so 
here's the thing. Um, do we know more now? Because I know that the discussions have been almost constant. Do we know more now about um, uh, what the makeup will be? Do we have some control over the membership so that we that, so that we're sure that there's a real even playing field be, between our system, which has the most riders and the most use of Presto and and the Metro Link the MetroLink system itself. Through the chair, in terms of the way that this governance has been structured, we have a seat at their table. So we're right. very much part of the procurement process, which is very different than the other transit agencies that are also members of Presto. Yes. So there, it's it's fully recognized that given the fact that we're the, we're the largest user of Presto, that our needs and requirements must play a critical part in the development of their RFP and the requirements coming forward. Okay. So is the, the purpose in having the three levels, is it really, is it a matter of having um, a sort of objective outside expertise in one group, uh, staff expertise in another, and then that overall sort of governance that comes from, you know, uh, from each, from the branch of each executive, Metrolinks board, TTC, et cetera, is, are we dividing it up by those types of functions, the three functions outside, inside staff? and governance, is that why there's three layers and three groups? I, I'm really, I'm struggling to understand the, the, the complexities of this governance, although it's, it's written in here at great length. I'm struggling to understand why we need the three. So uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, basically it's the usual structure, um, Commissioner, where uh, staff work at the program level. And so that's okay. where uh, Angela and I sit with uh, Annalise Turney and her staff from Presto. And we work through all the details. And then okay. we normally that's report the program it. Group. Yeah. That's right, up to executive, which is uh, our CEOs, um, Rick Leary and Phil Verster. And that's an accountability for Annalise and myself to ensure that the program is going in accordance with their directions and agreements. And then the thing that was added is the political oversight, if you would call it that, which is advisory. We called it a joint advisory group. And it's to ensure a line of sight for board members from the TTC. Um, to sit with two board members and the CEOs to uh, guide the CEOs if their direction to us is not really lined up with board thinking. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Thanks, Kat. Okay. Uh, sorry. Sometimes I turn off my video just to preserve my battery. I seem to have nonstop battery issues. So I believe those are all the questions. Um, we will now move to speakers on this item. Do we have any speakers? Oh, I'll speak. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just um, very pleased that um, they're moving ahead with the RFI. Um, I think it's really important that we have options. Um, I'm I'm uh, gratified to know that this commission started to process way in advance of the contract ending, and we have to have flexibility. Um, Presto is a is a archaic system, um, and they don't have they have neither the skills or the abilities to <clears throat> provide the services. That, that a modern city like the city of Toronto needs. And so I think that we need to look like alternative, we need to look at alternatives. And I'm not, I'm not just saying it, the facts prove this out. They've been a horrible vendor. They're difficult to deal with. And their technology is, is, comes from the dark ages. We're just trying to get them to use open payment when London had open payment in 2012. That's why we need to look at other options. And so I, I'm uh, very pleased that the commission is moving forward and taking um, this board's uh, uh, direction seriously. And I look forward to getting the results back uh, early, uh, later on this year. Thank you very much, Commissioner Carroll. Madam Speaker, um, I'm looking forward to some things too, but I, 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 to, with respect to my colleague, I think it's a little more complex than that. I think it's really important 
because of what staff may have to recommend that we keep in mind what's actually happening here. It is great that we are actually putting our own request for interest. We, that even having a vendor day might be great so that we know as much as possible about what, what is possible out there. But what I think is really important is that we, we, we are invested in Presto. And, and I, I think that the, the, responsible, the responsibility we have here is to make sure that the system becomes vastly improved for the rider. And lucky for us, Presto knows that their subcontracted deliverer has failed them and that they need a new solution too. They know they're frustrating the hell out of us and that this is all costing us more than we wanted without even delivering the open payment. What are our two biggest outstandings that all this governance system is going to work on? Open payment and system performance and functionality. Those are the two biggies for me. There, there are a couple more. There are five altogether that are outstanding deliverables and they, they can't get them from their subcontracted deliverer of their model. And they know that. But what I think is ingenious is that what our staff are doing is putting their timing together so that we have that, you know, very sort of, uh, uh, it's kind of a negotiative stance to put out our own RFI. And we have that coming at the same time that Presto seeks to solve these problems themselves on our behalf. And so we will have the option because uh, at the time we choose to break away and we may well decide to break away. They may not come up with the best solution in our view but to have a full wraparound look at this, both what they're proposing and what we might have out there in the market that we could look at ourselves, means that we'll make the best possible decision with the least amount of penalty. Because we are invested with Presto. We, we made that leap. Uh, uh, there, were, there were people around saying, let's not do this at the time, but we went in this direction. Uh, and so, if it's possible to see the solution through Presto's RFP, we do have to keep our our, uh, our minds open to the fact that they, they may succeed in doing that. And through this governance structure that's being set up, we may be able to make that work. Having both options is the real beauty of the action right now, not just the one, in my view. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'll just, uh, I don't have any other speakers on this on this item, according to the clerk. So I will just say open payment, open payment, open payment. I hear it from young people. When I mean young, I mean younger than me um, all the time. And uh, that is just something we've got to make happen. So um, it's a real frustrating issue, I think, for many residents in the city. Um, I'll leave it at that. And I will ask uh, for a motion on this item. Um, to move this along, so uh, to adopt the staff recommendations. Um, uh, Commissioner Lai, all those in favor? Approved, opposed, approved. Okay, let's move to our next item, which is item eight. And it's net transit network expansion. We have one deputation on this item, so we will start with those. And uh, the first, the first and only deputant is Alan Yule. So Alan, welcome. And um, if you could uh, start when the clock gets to five there, I think they're just uh, changing the clock right now. Head Alan, have we got Alan connected? Through the chair, the deputant is connected. We're just waiting for him to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? You can, Alan. Hello. Yes, Hello, and at last me? we can see your presentation. <laughs> Okie dokie, just one second here. Next slide, please. Full disclosure, I am a hardcore downtown Queen and Ronsi kind of person. I'm such a snob about it that I am proud of the fact that I managed to go three years without going north of Bloor, and I also think that a country bar is any bar north of north of Bloor Street. That being said, Mr. McKelvey knows that in the pre-COVID times, I traipsed all around Scarborough on a regular basis. This is a 50, next slide, please. 
This is a 52 page report on the grand plans for, our, for rapid transit projects. I'm happy to see these. I look forward to seeing many more rapid transit projects in the future. Next slide, please. But what is missing from this report and the discussions here today is a subject of a Toronto frequent transit network. Next slide, please. This is our express route network, but only one of these buses is 10 minutes or better. Next slide, please. This is our most current network map. Next slide. This is the map of the TTC's 10 minute or better routes. The yellow is my reality. The blue section is Scarborough's reality. Next slide, please. From my door, I am 40 seconds to four minutes away from four different 10 minute or better surface routes. Next slide, please. I'm at 10 minute walk or less to seven blue night routes. That is almost as many routes so that it make up all of Scarborough's blue night network. Next slide, please. We can't fix this all everything right now, but I would like to suggest a pilot project for your consideration. Next slide, please. Scarborough is not getting any major rapid transit expansion for at least the next decade. This is also where I'd like to do this pilot project. Next slide, please. The timing of this pilot project would start with the closing date of the SRT and would run for two years. Next slide. During this two year pilot project, all Scarborough bus routes would be set at 15 minutes or better. Express routes would be 15 minutes or better from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and standard routes would be 15 minutes better during their operating hours. Next slide, please. The residents of Scarborough are not getting any rapid transit for a while. At least we should try to make it frequent for them. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is there any questions for the deputant? Okay, I don't see any. So thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to move into the item. Okay, so um, any questions for staff on the uh, report before us? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was looking Hello. at what Chris Ann was saying, the clerk. Okay, let's start with our newest commissioner. You you can start it off. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair Robinson. And and this might be a, a stupid question, but I, I I'm curious to understand when if you know if this were to go through. Oh my God! If this were to go through, what what sort of is the management relationship between the employees, the 34 employees who are going to be coming in? Um, and the reason why I ask this is, you know, I'm curious about the extremities that could happen. What if they're not a fit for what we're doing? Uh, what if they're not doing a great job? Um, what if we, if we have to find a way to resource them differently? Obviously, Metrolinx is coming in and, and fronting the bill for the employees. But from a management perspective, um, who, who gets the call on that? Through the chair. Again, when we're actually looking to bring some of our people in, again, we'll be doing a recruitment search for all those people, and we'll be looking for people with experience working on our transit network. So first and foremost, we're looking for experienced people. Secondly, we'll be sharing the CVs uh, with, with Metrolinks on those people, so there is a good fit from them. And also that uh, some of those staff are actually going to be based in the Metrolinks offices. Uh, when when the projects when when we go over COVID, some of the key people will be based down there. So we've got this direct communications with uh, the, the Metrolink staff there. And again, we'll be seeking feedback how people are performing. And again, we've set up our own governance structure as well internally and how we do that. So we'll be looking and monitoring that internally through our governance structure as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to yield my time. That's the only question I had. Okay, thank you. So Commissioner Bradford is next. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, and thanks for the work on this report. Um, with regard to the piece that, that uh, is, is referring to the subway program re resource agreement, um, I, I look at uh, municipalities like Ottawa, for example, uh, where they've had some challenges finding solutions to the uh, the problems that the transit system is facing throughout the implementation and so within the 
within the TTC, I have a baby in my lap. Um, I'm wondering if we've done a jurisdictional sort of scan, um, looking at other, uh, other cities for how best to shape a resource agreement to make sure that we're getting the best outcome here in Toronto. Sorry. Work from home. Hey, Briar. I can take her for you if you want. Okay, through Did you the hear chair. That? Did that come through? I apologize. Yeah, I'll just uh, through the chair, I'll just give you a little bit of background how we came around to this. Again, as you're fully aware, you know, we you know we are working on the Edlington Crosstown just now and we're working on Finch. So when we started looking at our resource agreement, we looked at the the lessons learned from those and how we implemented them. And again, when you look back at those, it was, you know, there were I would say it's smaller scale to the four projects we're going to be doing just now because of the, the cumulative value of them. And again, when we looked at our resources, we had minimum dedicated staff to them and we tended to use mainly our own people on a part-time basis to support them. So that is not sustainable going forward, looking at these four major projects. So what we what we done, we looked internally and we actually got together quite a few of our internal groups from operations, customer strategy, finance, project controls, project management. And we looked at how we would actually implement a structure going forward. And just to, and so and that's how we come up with the 34 full time. And again, there's another bit, 90, approximately 92, what I would call full time equivalent. When you look at the amount of man hours we'll be burning, we may have to touch as many people as then. You know, the 34 is, based on our assessments at this point in time. Again, we're still working with Metrolinks to get a detailed work plan from them so we understand exactly what is there. So we're still working towards that. That number may grow in the future going forward. The 92, some of those may become full time depending on the, the, the output and the workload that we're actually being requested to do. So just to give you a bit of a detail on the resources, you know, we're in the process of uh, recruiting a full time uh, project director who will be the direct link between Metrolink senior sponsor on the, the, the four expansion projects and further just below him you will have from each of the groups you have a senior director within our operations group looking at and I'll get a little bit more explain about that where we have it employing uh, a director of engineering review because that will be a big part of that looking at the engineering and looking at the you know, all the PSOSs going out so we'll be heavily involved in that. And over and above that, we're bringing in a manager of project control. So we're actually going to control the project as, as we would an internal project, looking at the schedule, resources, costs, budgets going forward. And also from our customer strategy and experience group, we'll be bringing a, a manager and, a, and some teams, some people underneath them, to look at the project development and coordination. When I talk about coordination, I'm talking about transit planning across the network, across Toronto. So... Just to, a little bit okay, more I, I guess my question was, when we're structuring these sort of resource agreements, yep. uh, and, and you look at other jurisdictions, TransLink, Vancouver, British Columbia, you look at what's going on in Ottawa, yep. uh, are we, are, have there been lessons learned in those jurisdictions that we're able to apply to this particular relationship that we've seen has been challenged, you know, there have been challenges on, on Crosstown and Eglinton for sure, and going forward, and this kind of leads into my next question, I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm going to ask it. In Appendix 1, uh, we see that the TTC's proposed rules and responsibilities for the Ontario line, right? So yep. uh, do we have a sense of when we will have publicly accessible and reviewable materials for that work that Metrolinx is undertaking on the Ontario line? Um, and, you know, recognizing this was just proposed last month to Metrolinx, do we have a response or a sense of how that's going? Um, as we, you know, with Bill 107 and the upload and increasingly transit expansion is going to be very much a provincial led supported by us sort of operation. I think that us dialing in on these resource agreements and this working relationship is going to be more important now than ever. And, and that's kind of the question and comment. Okay. Just, like I said, I mentioned earlier on, we're taking our lessons learned from uh, our crosstown. I've also got a lot of experience coming from Europe and developing these sort of relationships. So putting my lessons learned in through it as well. And also what's happened in Ottawa, we've sent our operations teams across there as well to look at, you know, the lessons learned from oper the, the operating side and how that, you know, the, 
the issues they had and how we would avoid that going forward. So yes, we have taken a lot of lessons learned uh, from other jurisdictions as well. Thank you, and um, we're going to move to... Sorry, the okay. second piece about the Ontario line and uh, if we've heard anything back on the submission we made last month. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. It was the last part. Do we have a sense of when we're going to have publicly accessible and available materials for the work that Metrolinx is undertaking on the Ontario line um, as it relates to working with the TTC? Again, we're working with, well, to answer that question, they've already published the documents when they will actually be putting out the P-sources uh, on those. So we've got access to some of the, the information, but not all of the inform information at this point in time. And again, that's why we want the close coordination working with them and, and bringing our team uh, on board and our dedicated staff so we have real-time information based from the, the dialogue within their offices. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. You and uh, Commissioner McKelvey is next. Thank you, Madam Chair. And firstly, I think it's very mean of Councillor Bradford to float that cute little baby that we're not allowed to snuggle during COVID. So anyway, I just want to express that I'm very aggravated by that. Um, so my question is about um, hiring of these new positions. And we've also heard that the city is looking to have a lot of hiring for the transit expansion office. Metrolinx is hiring. So um, how, how, how is the pool out there of candidates and you're all competing in the same pond? And so um, are you ready to issue your hires um, and beat others to it? Through the chair, yes, we have. We have, like I said, we've actually in the process of hiring our, our overall project director. Again, we've been working with HR to look at job descriptions for all the rest of the positions. Some of them are ready to be issued. Uh, when you spoke about uh, Metrolinx and others, yes, we're all going to be fishing from the same pond, effectively, because we're all be looking for the same type of resources. Uh, but again, we've also got in place, we have got several consultant contracts in place that we'll be using, utilising as well. If we can't find people on, you know, t uh, through uh, our full-time recruitment, we will also be utilising our consultant contracts to bring people in in a short term until we actually get dedicated staff coming in. Okay. And when I look at the, uh, the hires that are happening um in the Toronto Expansion Office as well. I had asked for a briefing note for them of resources dedicated to both the Eglinton East LRT and the Waterfront LRT. And Toronto Transit Commission has eight, eight um, employees that are already working on this project. I note that they have no employees that were working on the Eglinton East LRT. In total, we have almost 10 employees working on the waterfront and only four employees between both agencies working on the Eglinton East LRT. So I guess, how how are you determining who is doing what between these different projects and and how is it decided when they lie with TTC versus the city? Th through the chair on this one, again, we work closely with the Transit Expansion Office and look at to make sure that we're not duplicating each other's work. Again, predominantly, you know, the, the city will kick off a project and then we will take it through the different levels of concept, detail, design. As we're doing in Waterfront just now, we're working very, very closely with the city on that one. We're doing the detailed design, but we're coordinating through the city and others with the rest of that project. So we do have clear lines of responsibility and we work through those. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cal Carol is next. Thanks. I'm wondering if I have to wait for another report. I can't find any mention of the Shepherd subway in this report. Is my, the motion that I moved a few months ago, is that going to come back in the form of another report? It, it appears nowhere in, in the priorities here. So have we made no progress with the province in making it a priority? Let me see, for you, Chair, can I ask if um, Scott is, is uh, on the line and can give us an, any update on where we know what that, what that stands? I'm, I'm having a, or uh, I see James Furler there as well, uh, but I'm not having a recall myself. Well, my time's going so, by so, while okay. I'm figuring out who's going to answer me about Shepherd Avenue. I'll, I'll get in there quickly. Uh, Thank you. 
Commissioner Carroll, through the through the chair, um, the while the the province has announced that that they intend to move ahead with the Shepherd extension after the Scarborough subway, no work has begun on that yet. There has been no conversation or or any substantive work on that project, so there really is nothing at this stage to indicate beyond conversations. So what we what we have here is a plan that uh, optimistically plans on, uh, we're gonna have the, the, the driving by the Crosstown every day is the most exciting thing ever. It looks like it's gonna be ready. So we'll have the Crosstown initial uh, phases. Uh, Finch West is supposed to be done in 2023, according uh, to this report, and all done by 2030. All of these are supposed to be in service. By 2023, Finch West LRT in service, that's two years from now, and then the Line 1 expansion, the Line 2 expansion, which is the Scarborough subway, the Ontario line, and the Eglinton East expansion are all simultaneously going to go into service in 20, by the end of 2030. Um, that's, that's the long and the short of this report. Um, is it safe to say that we have never had that much expansion going on in, in, in a seven year time frame? Uh, all four of those lines will be under construction in the same seven years. Uh, Scott Haskell here through, through the chair. You, you are correct. In the early 1960s, there was effectively two subways under construction, but there has never been this many lines under construction in Toronto at once. So we're looking at if we can do this, if we can get all the shovels in the ground, we're going to have more subway construction going on in the city than we have ever had before. So while there hasn't been a report back on my motion, can I assume that, that it really isn't going to be possible to start work on the Shepherd subway until 2030? Uh, through the chair, I'll jump in. I, I think that it's, um, it, that that's a reasonable assumption that work may be able to start a little bit before then in terms of some of the the initial planning but um what you need to add on to that is also the go expansion work that's happening as well this is a massive undertaking and and there are limited um limited resources as commissioner mckelvey was talking about to to do it all right so this report really tells me that i that i have to accept that and i and i do uh, but my, but it's hard for my community to accept that, since they have um, either either already built or or to be built within the next five years more population density on any of the lines in this report. There are more 33 and 40 story buildings than any of these lines will 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 exist uh, along Shepherd Avenue by the time all of these lines are are done, um, and so it. This is tough for the community to swallow all the way out to Kennedy. As far as Kennedy and in, in new councillor Mantis's ward, uh, this much density is being built. So if that is not the case and there is no mention of Shepherd in this report, what I would ask is further to my previous motions and, and the request for a report back on um, uh, an, until the subway strategy, how we move all of that population that has built between the Leslie GO station and the Agent Court GO station along Shepherd Avenue. When might I expect that report and from whom shall I expect that report? James, I hate, I hate to ask you, my friend, but uh, Sorry. if you would. Okay. Um, I think the, the one thing, Councillor, that I would point to is the joint work that the city, TT, the city Planning Transportation Services and the TTC are doing on the surface transit corridors. And Shepherd was one of the identified corridors, uh, not one of the first six, but we will be advancing all of those. And I think thinking about what are some surface transit uh, improvements that could be made along Shepherd could be part of an interim response there that we'll need to work through. Um, so I've moved so, so that as a motion, both in yeah. the city and the TTC, all yes. a little less than 12 months. So so soon the 12 month uh, timeline will be there. Should I remove those motions when I get to the 12 month anniversaries to remind people that that looming population crisis between uh, where line four ends currently and, and Kennedy uh, agent court go station is is still coming along and the, the suites are being occupied and the population is coming. Do I do I need to move the motions again? Through the chair, 
Oh, oh sorry, Rick. I'll take the thank you, James. And no, uh, Council, you don't have to move that. We'll uh, take that away, and we'll uh, get back to you on this. It was it was moved last February. Last February, I was just advised as well. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, Gary, if uh, you've answered this, but I just want to be crystal clear about these 34 temporary positions and exactly uh, what will they will these individuals be doing? Again, through the chair, you know, we'll be looking at, obviously they've got to, when you look at the, the project director, he'll be looking at the, the, the coordination. We've got dedicated project managers who are working with each of the project sponsors. Uh, we've got our, our senior director in operations. They'll be looking at the operations and maintenance aspects of the four lines going forward. So they'll be working through there. Uh, the project controls element will be looking at how we control the and working with the, the Metrolinks to produce the schedule so that we can support them with the right resources going forward. Uh, and again, we're looking at from the, the customer strategy, they'll be looking at the network planning and how their plans fit into the overall plans for Toronto and the TTC. That's a very high level. Permit work? Sorry, did you, Gary, did you hear me? Is there any procurement work that these- When we talk do? about procurement, the, the certain elements of procurement, we, we will be working with them, looking at their PSOS and their pre procurement going forward. We need to make sure that our requirements are going to be based in the PSOS so that the, the operation and maintenance requirements are met through the contract. So we'll be looking and working with them through those uh, elements of the work to ensure the procurement is going to be fit for purpose when it comes across to the TTC with respect to operations and maintenance. You also talk about fleet as well. Again, we're, we're, again, there's two elements that myself and Kirsten will be talking to them very shortly. We're talking about signaling systems on line one and line two, and we're also talking about the fleet requirements. You know, as you're fully aware, we have got a massive procurement looking at the, our fleet requirements. And again, we've already had the discussion with Metrolinx, it would be best if they piggyback on our contract because we're, we're buying the quantity, so they would get the best deal through that. So we're working closely with them. And the third element we're looking at is a transit control system uh, centre. It's where we want a single dedicated transit control centre controlling all networks within Toronto as well. So these are three elements we're working with them. So just to, just to dumb this down um, for me, um, like when you're dealing with, you know, city bridges and city sewer systems, underground uh, infrastructure, would you be facilitating that work on behalf of Metrolink? When you look at the diversions and permits approvals, that will begin through the Transit Expansion Office and not through the TTC. It's only where it impacts our infrastructure that we will be getting involved in those sort of uh, details. When you talk about the, the interface with the stations like PAPE on the Ontario line and others, it's only when it affects our infrastructure we'll get involved that way. The rest will be through the Transit Expansion Office. Okay, thank you very much. I believe we're moving to speakers now, unless I've missed something I don't think I have. So uh, who would like to speak on this item? Okay, Commissioner uh, Carroll, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Madam Speaker. So, you know, further to my question, uh, you know, have we ever done this before? And, and granted, there, there are, there are uh, multiple governments here. We're not going to be delivering this, this, this all. But but that any government would would set simultaneous deadlines for this much major work, um, I think what we're going to find is, uh, as we study it, is that to do all four simultaneously is going to provide so much disruption uh, that that some of the there will be a drift in these timelines one way or another. Uh, Finch West LRT is way out there. Uh, uh, far from, from other disruptions, but when we get into the line one expansion, uh, then uh, we're going to see, you know, ridership flowing into other areas and cars flowing into other areas to avoid that construction. Uh, when we get into to the line two expansion, the Scarborough subway, 
and the Eglinton East all happening at once, that's really taking away a lot of mobility, whether it's ridership or car driving, to a huge swath of Scarborough. So that's going to be very difficult to execute all at once. And, and, and then, of course, lastly, the Ontario line, which really, because of the way it rings around the core, all of the community that's trying to get to the core, again, whether it's transit, go, or, or people driving by cars, it's going to be a huge amount of disruption. I know that, you know, at Council, we're, we're forever getting comments and motions from Councillor Fletcher, who's very concerned about how it cuts a swath through the east end of the city while it's being built, and there's great concern there. So there's going to be drift in these deadlines. There's no question about it. But what concerns me is that there seems to be no alignment and, and no concern about trying to somehow match up these deadlines with where the growth happens in our community. And so based on Transit City, which is long gone as of, of 2011, we are still being forced to apply the provincial growth policy on Shepherd Avenue. And it's the provincial government who's decided that it's not their priority. Uh, at one point, it was an LRT. The premier took great delight in saying, no, now it will be a subway. But he seems to have no interest in building it. And, um, you know, I am looking forward to that report coming back because, quite frankly, if there's drift in these other projects and in another area, we could actually get started on that line, which starts with digging a tunnel from the, the Don Mill station under the parkway, there's an endeavor. If, if we could somehow incorporate in all of these plans at some point where the, where the, the tunneling device is, is done on one project and we're now above ground with, with LRT tracks for Eglinton or whatever, that that tunneling begins on the, the Shepherd Avenue, Avenue line has to become something that we're advocating for or we're doing a tremendous disservice because what we are doing is building a transit neighborhood, putting 43 story buildings. That, that's in provincial divisional court. That was decided what we could accommodate in my ward and a little beyond it. 43 stories of residential buildings, 500 units per, the pinnacle out in, in Councillor Mantis's ward. And yet there will be no transit for them other than a conventional bus system, not even a BRT. And if we can't somehow tell them that they're causing us a, a huge uh, burden on our system, I don't know how we serve it with the, with the Shepherd Avenue bus line, we're going to have a very big problem by 2030, not just for me, but for everyone in Scarborough who lives near the 401 or north of it. That's just, that's just the way it is. And since it's not a provincial priority, I think that's where we take on our role to advocate for the pieces they're missing. Thank you. Those are my comments, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I just want to clarify, uh, Commissioner McKelvey, did you did you want to speak on this, or are you you're happy with your questions? Okay. Um, I have got a motion. I'm going to move. Uh, if the clerk could put it up on the screen, it's pretty vague, but I just feel it's important to monitor uh, what's unfolding. And that is, in fact, I had this before this report was released, I had these questions about the TEO office, um, the transit expansion, expansion office at City Hall. So I remember when the city manager was cooking this uh, plan up to create this office. And um, at, the, at the time there was one individual, uh, Derek and Derek alone. Uh, unfortunately, then I got sick and I wasn't able to track this, but I have to say, um, I'm not crystal clear on the roles. And so I guess this, the objective of this motion is just to monitor and track what's happening um, and how it impacts the TTC with the uh, endeavor that's happening at City Hall. And that all the efforts and initiatives and work are aligned. I think that's so important. And, um, you know, it, the funny part was when uh, I think the city manager was thinking about this. So, suddenly we got the surprise attack, you might almost call it, that the province was going to upload everything. And um, that was almost shocking because I don't know if you recall how it happened, but it was fast and furious. And I think council was a bit blown away by it. Um, and um, suddenly it was done. So I just want to monitor um, what's happening at Metrolinks. 
and what's happening at City Hall and what's happening at the TTC. And this motion isn't very detailed, my apologies. Uh, I pulled it together very quickly, but it's the concept here is just who's on first, you know, um, some of this was, mu much of it was uploaded and um, what are the roles and are they clear and make sure we're not stepping on each other's toes and um, fast tracking all of this because as Councillor Carroll has said, we, we got to move. Uh, the city's growing in leaps and bounds and we've got to get these things built. So that's my objective is just to take, take a little bit of a bird's eye view on what's happening and making sure it's all lining up. Uh, because TTC is uh, a big major part of this and we're the board and we need to know uh, who's playing what role and that the TTC, you know, who often is the go-to organization for Metrolinx, quite frankly, when Metrolinx thinks about transit, period, in Toronto, uh, their first thought is TTC. And there's a very, um, you know, it's, sometimes it's a tense relationship, but of late it's been a better relationship, I think, thanks partially to Commissioner Lalonde and Commissioner uh, De Laurentiis, our vice chair, but um, you know we have to uh, we have to keep these things moving forward. And so that's my objective, and with this um, with this motion, is just to, to keep an eye on what's unfolding. And that's it. Um, I, if we could move to voting uh, on this item, and then we're going to move to the next item, which has a number of deputations. So. Uh, on this item, I will move, uh, so I guess first the amended, the amendment, um, the motion I just place. Uh, all those in favor, opposed, carry, and then I'll move the staff recommendations. Uh, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Okay, now we're moving to our next item, which is item number nine. Uh, the SRT Life Extension Project Options Analysis. Um, and we've got, I think, at least nine deputations on this, uh, which we will start now. So uh, our first deputant is Michael Rain, and um, I'm hoping that the clerks can get him connected for his, his, his presentation. Chair, our first deputant uh, will be Meredith Lorden. We're having issues connecting with Michael. Go ahead, Meredith. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Hello? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Terrific. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I will be brief. Um, I work in the Bendale community in the Midland and Lawrence area, and I take the RT to work every day. It is a community that absolutely needs to continue to maintain transit access, and I'm very deeply troubled by the fact that this closure limits that access. Even with increased bus capacity, we know social distancing isn't happening on buses currently. We don't know and we can't speculate what the pandemic or new forms or, or variants or strains might look like into the future of 2023, which is the anticipated date of closure. Bus capacity needs to be augmented with continued support of the LRT. I have other concerns about the extent to which there was community um, opportunities for input because I know as somebody who lives in that, sorry, I live downtown and I take the RT to Lawrence East Station each day for work. I work at David and Mary Thompson Collegiate. I wonder and worry about the inaccessibility that the closure creates. I urge the TTC to revisit this decision to ensure greater access for all members of the Bendale community region to be able to access transit at all times between now, 2023, and beyond. Thank you for the opportunity to present before you today. Thank you very much. Um, and do we have any questions for the deputant? I don't see any. So thank you for your presentation. And we'll move to our next um, deputant. I don't know if you've been able to get Michael Rain on board, but if not, then we would um, go to Zane. If I could ask the clerk to um, advise who's up next, whether it's Michael or Zane. The next deputant is Zane. Uh, go ahead, Zane. We'll just need you to unmute, please.
Chair, it appears that Zane may be having problems unmuting. We're going to proceed to Jamal Myers. Jamal, please go ahead. Or not. Hello? Go ahead, Jamal. Problems unmuting. We're going to proceed to Jamal Myers. Jamal, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Um, uh, good morning, members of the TTC board. Um, my name is Jamal Myers, and I'm a direct. Go ahead, Jamal. Can you hear me? Jamal, if you could turn the volume down on your YouTube feed, um, we can hear you in the room. I could just get clarification. Are we able to um, get Jamal on board here? Chair, it appears that there may be some technical issues um, on the deputant's end. I've moved the next deputant in, Sarah Abdullahi. Abdelal okay. And we're just waiting for her to unmute. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? Yes, Sarah, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Perfect. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the TTC board. My name is Sarah Abdullahi. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the president of the Scarborough Campus Students Union at UTSC. I'm an active community member from Humber River, River Black Creek, but I do commute by TTC to the Scarborough UTSC basically almost every day since my first year. I would like to thank you for the, giving me the opportunity to speak and amplify the voices of the 14,000 undergraduate UTSC students that I represent. Uh, the demands of the students of UTSC uh, that we want to see happen are basically the following. We all know that the SRT is one of the ways students, faculty members, families, essential workers get to where they need to go within Scarborough. We are also very aware that the SRT is outdated and has reached its limits and is gonna be removed in the next couple of years. As a commuter, it's already very difficult traveling in Scarborough in comparison to the other neighborhoods because of the long wait time, bus wait times. And it's clear as day that the TTC has prioritized every other neighborhood and community except for Scarborough, and that is not okay. The fact that we have to ask and beg for a better transit in Scarborough is not okay. That is why when you folks are replacing the SRT with a different service, I want you to seriously consider the residents of Scarborough and the students like me who commute to Scarborough every single day. We want one for you to install a dedicated bus lane so that the buses will be more closely match the speed and passenger capacity that the SRT currently provides. Two, buy more buses more specifically like the electro, uh, electrical, like the e-buses, um, so that we're also taking care of the only planet that we've got. Uh, so service levels in this corridor can be maintained. And so bus service across the city does not suffer when many vehicles will be required to replace the SRT train. Three, and this one is very obvious, Keep the SRT land in public hands while replaced transit options are being explored. And four, ask the province to fund transfers between GO trains and TTC buses so TTC passengers can also use the GO train network. Within your TTC report, uh, there's three options that we saw. Option number two seems like the most feasible that students would like to see, uh, but we do have some amendments. So for option number two, point number one, um, if you could get more than 60 buses, that would be amazing uh, because we do need buses and we need buses now. For point number two, the bus rapid transit or dedicated bus lanes are needed so that uh, the replaced bus service is as fast as possible. And lastly, for point number three, along with the residents and advocates of, tr of transit in Scarborough, we do not support the plan of transferring the SRT infrastructure 
to Metrolinx to be decommissioned. We are calling on the city to keep the SRT infrastructure while other options are being currently explored, like the bus rapid transit. As the president of the Scarborough Campus Students Union and as a commuter, along with my 14,000 student members, are aware of what you folks are doing and the, de the decisions you folks are making. So please take our request seriously because we aren't going anywhere and we will always continue to fight for better transit in Scarborough. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. And any questions? I see a question from Commissioner McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for your deputation. Um, I'm also a proud uh, UTSC Hi. alumni. Um, I, I, firstly, I want to commend you for commuting from Humber. That is quite the haul. Um, I know that, that um, school hasn't been sitting since last September. So I'm wondering if students have had the opportunity to use the new dedicated bus lanes that go from Kennedy Station to Scarborough campus. And have you had any feedback on that yet? Yes, so students have been using the dedicated bus lanes um, to come to campus because um, we do need access to internet. Um, even though like uh, classes are not happening in session, students do come to UTSD to go use the library uh, for internet. Um, and just like because they can't work from home and they need a safe space for them to continue doing their degree. Um, so students have been using transit um, and with the SRT closing like that does create a barrier because I also come to campus because I don't have internet like stable high uh, speed internet at home. So for me to even do this deputation for me to do any work for SCSU or for the like just in general with my classes, I would have to come to campus and I travel through the SRT. I travel through the transit bus only lanes um, to get to campus pretty much. Okay, uh, thank you. The reason I ask is you know, I think a lot of the rationale is if you build it, they will come. So it's important that we check that students are using uh, the bus lanes and and thank you. We I think we all recognize that if the SRT shut down, there, there has to be some sort of improved bus service. So um, thank you. And I look forward to the discussion we're going to have on that later today. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. So um, for your presentation and answering the question, we're going to move on. And I think we're going to go try to go back to Zane because we, we miss Zane. And just to the clerk, have we have we got Zane lined up for his deputation? Clerk, we're just waiting, or sorry, chair, we're just waiting for Zane to unmute. Okay, great. Zane, please go ahead. You have five minutes. Chair, Zane is unmuted, but we're not able to get sound um, from Zane. So can we go ahead to... Um... Moya or we can move forward we can Hello. Oh, oh go ahead Zane you have five minutes can you can you guys hear me I just want to confirm yes we can please proceed perfect perfect I don't know what was happening before but I'm glad to fix it. all right <clears throat> good afternoon members of the TDC board my name is Zane Crook I'm a member of the city's council of Toronto a demographically elected group of 25 each representing one of the 25 wards in Toronto. Scarborough has historically always been lacking in rapid transit. We've been receiving the back end of transit expansion for decades now. Comparing the size of the borough to the current number of stations, the difference is huge and will go up with the closure of the SRT, ultimately serving fewer residents. As a high school student who frequently took the SRT pre-COVID, I can state that students, students and youth depend on the service that the SRT provides. Whether it's taking it to get to the University of Toronto Scarborough campus or David and Mary Thompson Collegiate Institute, we rely on it. I remember taking on three of my friends and us marveling how a 35 year old train was still able to tra transport us in exactly eight minutes. In contrast, taking the 903 Kennedy Scarborough Center Express, an express bus which mimics the SRT alignment on Brimley Road, took more than double the time. While retaining the SRT is preferred, Option one is costly and unreasonable for just seven years more of operation. That being said, the City Youth Council supports option two. However, we fear that with the shutdown of the SRT and the additional crowd of buses competing with traffic 
will create massive delays and traffic congestion, especially at the intersections of Company Kennedy and Scarborough Center Station as subway construction begins to eat up the lane. For this reason, I call on the TDC Board to urge the Toronto Transit Commission to create and implement a BRT lane for the buses to operate on, whether it be a, a busway on the existing SRT corridor from Kennedy Station to Ellesmere Road, so similar to the York University busway, or if not feasible, then we request planning and resources be allocated to constructing an on-street BRT light on Midland Avenue, similar to the likes of the Eglinton East Rapid Teal Lane. Additionally, we request the TDC retain the current SRT right-of-way uh, until other options are explored and com community consultations have been conducted. Like it or not, the SRT is an integral part of Scarborough's history and development. While residents may complain about the squeaking noises or the odd smell from Midland Station, we still adore the service it provides, as it's the only service we have. That being said, the demolition of the SRG corridor and then the selling off of the land would be disrespectful to the residents who had to put up with more than a decade of transit debate. We should take this opportunity to create something beautiful and open it up for the community to use. It could be turned into a wonderful art installation or a refreshing rail deck park and trail, similar to those found in New York. It is a valuable piece of land that should not be given up at any cost without community consultation. Adding on, we request the TDC to procure articulated electric, electric buses rather than a standard 40 feet hybrid buses. Comparing one 40 foot bus to one SRT train concept, the rider capacity ratio is about uh, one to four. Unless we have four buses leaving a station at one time, which would never happen, riders will end up waiting longer for crowded buses. But with articulated buses, the ratio increase, increases to one to two. With that, it leads to our final request. The current SRT arrives every five minutes on the dock. The City Youth Council requests that the current SRT service level be met with a bus replacement. It is not fair for Scarborough commuters, uh, commuters to wait for four buses. It is not fair for Scarborough commuters who will have to wait seven more years for a replacement subway line when they did not ask for delayed transit improvement. The TDC knew that this day would come, yet decisions were ensure, actions were postponed, and now we're ultimately left with nothing. That being said, the TDC should uphold and honor the service of the SRT by deploying buses every five minutes or less. In short, the City Youth Council supports option two. However, we are additionally requesting retention of the SRT corridor with community consultations being held, the procurement of articulated electric buses, and finally, for the SRT level, uh, service level be met with the bus replacement. The SRT arrives every five minutes on the dot, and Scarborough deserves the same service and better for the bus replacement. With that, I conclude. My name is Zane Curran, my youth counselor for Ward 25, who is passionate about the decisions being made for tra transit in the borough he lives in. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. I hand it off to the chair. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Zane. Uh, are there any questions for Zane? Okay, I don't see any. So thank you, Zane, for your presentation today. I'm going to move back to Jamal because apparently thank we have now me. connected with, with uh, him. So let's. Uh, Hi proceed. You have five minutes. Uh, can you hear me? This is Jamal. Hello? Jamal, Jamal, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, members of the TTC board. My name is Jamal Myers, and I'm a director and chairperson of the Advocacy and Policy Committee of the Scarborough Business Association, the voice of Scarborough's businesses and entrepreneurs. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. After careful review and consideration of the TTC's options for replacing the SRT, the SBA has come to the firm conclusion that option two is in the best interest of Scarborough. Despite this, option two has significant flaws which is not rectified through a transparent and honest consultation with our community will lead to increased anger and frustration that many of us currently feel towards the TTC and the city over the SRT replacement debacle. To recap, Option two would see the SRT continue until 2023 and then be replaced by a bus replacement service from 2023 until the Scarborough subway is open. We support option two because it will make all five SRT stops accessible to all members of our community. We also support its recommendations for transit signal priority, queue jump lanes for buses, and reserved bus lanes. We do note that the report says that there is no current availability for storage buses procured under option two at existing PTC facilities. And we therefore would like the TTC report to include a solution for storing these vehicles. 
Moreover, the report makes no mention of allowing Scarborough's TTC riders to use GO stations at no extra cost while the SRT is being replaced. Presto cards were adopted to promote fair integration in part between TTC and GO. Therefore, the technology to do this exists and any final report for the SRT replacement should include a thorough analysis of the feasibility of this option. Allowing Scarborough Transit users to use GO train stations at no extra cost would provide an affordable transit option for riders, could potentially reduce commuter times for some riders, and may help alleviate pressure on any SRT replacement bus service. Despite our, option for our support for option two, the SBA has two significant concerns with the proposal. First, while we acknowledge that hybrid buses are cleaner than diesel, we strongly recommend that the TTC purchase electric buses. Climate change is a serious threat to our community, which is disproportionately racialized and low income. For our businesses, increased costs associated with climate change from increased flooding and more frequent and severe storms threaten to raise their operating costs. Scarborough's per capita greenhouse gas emissions from personal vehicles are the highest in the city, and overall, 38% of Toronto's greenhouse gas emissions are from the transportation sector, with 79% of these emissions coming from cars. We must purchase emission-free buses whenever possible in order to help mitigate the worst effects of climate change. Secondly, and most importantly, the SBA is strongly opposed to the TTC's intention to transfer the SRT's infrastructure to Metrolink and Infrastructure Ontario for demolition. Love it or hate it, the SRT has been a part of our community for over 35 years. Whatever our complaints are with the SRT, its stations and right-of-way have become a key part of Scarborough's urban fabric and community infrastructure. Entire neighbourhoods have sprung up around RT stations and, them, and the stations themselves have become major sources of local pride as each year we see them transformed as part of our Nuit Blanche celebrations. To simply hand them over along with the invaluable right-of-way without any input or consultation from my community is not just unacceptable, unacceptable, it's wrong. Future ownership over SRT infrastructure should be included at any public consultation. Scarborough has no shortage of ideas on what can be done with SRT stations and, and the right-of-way after the our SRT is decommissioned. From a dedicated bus rapid transit route between Kennedy and Scarborough Town Centre, to creating a cycling highway, to an elevated park akin to New York City's High Line, to repurposing RT stations as outdoor markets or community centres, we recognize the value in these assets. Moreover, the money used to demolish these assets would go a long way in helping to explore and implement any of these transformative ideas. In closing, I would just like to finish on a quote from Toronto's own Jane Jacobs. Cities need old buildings so badly, it is probably impossible for vigorous streets and districts to grow without them. For really new ideas of any kind, no matter how ultimately profitable or otherwise successful, some of them might prove to be there is no leeway for such chancy trial, error, and experimentation in the high overhead economy of new construction. Old ideas can sometimes use new buildings. New ideas must use old buildings. In less than two years, Scarborough will have five old buildings and a four-mile right-of-way. If the SBA, It is the SBA's belief that a community revitalization project using the SRT infrastructure would go a long way to help heal the deep community wounds caused by the Scarborough subway debate. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Are there any questions for the speaker? Uh, Councillor, Commissioner Carroll, go ahead. Um, yes, please. Uh, um, I'm really intrigued and, and really happy to hear that, that there's already discussion going on about if we were to hang on to that real estate, the kinds of community hub and community building uh, efforts could go on in that the 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 decommissioned rt real estate are some of the things that you talked about markets etc are those are those being discussed in organized groups like like the business association and so on and so forth um they're being discussed more in informal groups so there is an informal scarborough transportation meeting group of different community members and those are just some of the ideas that are being floated in terms of what can we do with this real estate, um, whether it's the RT stations or the actual right of way. And I yeah. think there's no consensus, but everybody agrees that we'd want to hang on to it and sort of have a full community consultation with that. And of course, the SBA would love to get involved with that. So if we were to transportation group. 
Yeah, so if we were to hang on to it for at least the next couple of years, we could at least study these ideas and, and give the community some time to organize around them. That's that's your fundamental as today, right? Absolutely. Well, uh, there's a lot of community interest in these properties in terms of what they can do. And you have to remember, there's whole neighborhoods built around these stations and the right of way. So a lot of good work can be done with these properties. Absolutely. Quite, quite familiar. I, I, I park in front of one uh, several times a week when I go to visit my dad. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, Jamal. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Again, thank you for your uh, words today. We're going to move on to our next deputant, which is Teresa uh, from the University of Toronto Faculty Association. Teresa Zorak. Hopefully we got, thank we you. got online. Uh, if, if you, we can hear you so you can start. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, TTC com commissioners. Um, yes, my name is Teresa Zorek and I'm president of the University of Toronto Faculty Association. I'm also a transit rider. Notably, I write my members fairly regularly about issues and not in recent memory have I had so strong a reaction as I did when I wrote faculty and librarians who work at the Scarborough campus. Um, the emotional responses I had were rather overwhelming. I'll do, I'll do my prepared remarks, but I was struck after I wrote them by the passion with which my members responded to my call. UTSC professors, instructors, staff, and students rely on the TTC to get to campus. It's no surprise to anyone that the SRT will need to be shut down. But it is disappointing that this long expected day has nearly arrived while the SRT replacement has not. Like you, I'm painfully aware that the transit city plan that was scrapped in 2010 included a fully funded LRT replacement for this route, a Scarborough Malvern LRT and a dedicated bus route on Ellesmere, all of which would have greatly improved access to our campus. Likewise, the One City Transit Plan in 2012 also included a Malvern LRT and a dedicated bus rapid transit line along Ellesmere. And of course, long before Transit City, even before the SRT, the need for rapid transit in Scarborough was firmly established and plans were developed in the 70s for a Scarborough streetcar network, of which the new route now occupied by the SRT would have been a key component. Unfortunately, none of these rapid transit plans came to fruition, and not for lack of trying. The time has come to invest more and better in Scarborough, not in the overpriced overcapacity subway, but in transit that will get people moving beyond this one corridor. The line is important, but it is not all that is important in Scarborough. The Scarborough Town Centre is not the only destination. 13,000 students are taught every term at UTSC. We need improved transit to our campus and many other destinations across Scarborough. Students and staff come to campus from every direction, not only Kennedy Station. Toronto needs more emission-free buses to support the passenger volume currently handled by the SRT trains and to ensure service levels aren't reduced on any of the other bus routes servicing our campus from other directions or the campus downtown. Investing in above ground rapid transit would be even better. I join with the UTSC Students Union, TTC, drive, TTC drivers, perhaps TTC riders, the Scarborough Transit Alliance, Scarborough Transit Action, and Connect Shepherd East in calling for four things. First, more emission-free buses to be purchased to maintain current SRT service levels so that the bus service in other areas isn't reduced to free up service on this corridor. Two, a dedicated bus-only route to run them in so that SRT speeds can be maintained. I heard harrowing tales um, from the emails I received about multi-hour um, uh, uh, transit times that, that actually astonished me. I didn't, I didn't previously understand. Three, keeping the SRT land in public hands because we know transit plans in this corridor have frequently changed and might change again. So best to keep our options open. And fourth, and perhaps most significantly for my members and students, 
demand that the province fully fund transfers between the GO trains and TTC buses so that TTC passengers can also use the GO train network to travel across Scarborough. We knew this day was going to arrive, it's been coming, and yet no construction has begun. If Scarborough service must be reduced to just buses, at least buy more of them, make them emission free, and invest in dedicated, dedicated bus corridors. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Any questions? Uh, Commissioner Carroll. Uh, well, first of all, uh, that, uh, that, that is the, the deputation available to us in writing. Could, would you be sending it into the clerk? Um, I thought it had been sent in already. I'll make sure you have a written copy. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. I, I'll check with uh, Ms. Finnerty then, because I, I, I think it's something that we need to remember going back to, to council even. So in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, making sure that there are dedicated bus lanes wherever, that's, that's different from, we, we heard from the deputant who was talking about a BRT in, in the, you know, the, the swath of land that, that the RT travels through. But if that's not possible, um, you, you think that the community would support making sure that, that we have dedicated lanes uh, where we need to, to support this? Um, I think that was one of the clearest asks that yeah. um, there's a need, there's a need. I mean, people, people are trying to make compromises to make TTC work for them. My members are saying that it's ridiculous that it's impossible to cycle from where they live to campus because it's not safe and it's impossible for them to choose TTC if it's three or four times longer to take TTC than it would be to drive. And some of my members are, of course, themselves climate change researchers and, and um, at the forefront of the fight against climate change, and they find themselves driving to work and they can't stand it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and if we go forward with dedicated lanes, we do have to do some some consultation. Is the community, the ridership community, uh, organizing so that if we if we should proceed with community consultations, a challenge that we always have. We, I, I'm I, my my ward is in North York, and we and we have it there as well. Is that we hold consultations in places where chances are because people are making long commutes most of the people who attend the consultation are car drivers not not riders um and where would you suggest if you i don't know if you've given any thought to this but if we want to consult about where best to put dedicated lanes how to support people with uh with uh, uh, uh bus transit for this difficult period uh where could we consult to make sure that we're reaching riders and, and gathering their opinions as well what are they would they answer online how would we do that well you know all bets are off in zoom times but it seems to me that um this is this is where you try to cohort my members are people who especially with housing prices in the downtown core are going to live um in any and i mean i i, I recognize Scarborough is um, an overwhelmingly racialized and low-income area, but the students who we teach are coming from far afield. I would think anything uh -huh. that located conversations on the Scarborough campus itself, if you were doing in-person or organized through a combination of faculty and students at UTSC would right. be uh, allowing you to, I mean, many students are going from Scarborough to St. George and right. in the other direction. So I think we need to think not just about where people live, but where they study and work. Um, U of T is, of course, a major employer. And um, mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think that there would be really strong support for, for organizing with the cohort that is the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. Yes, that's, that's right. Again. That's going to be my new buzzword, cohorted consultation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank, 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 thank you. you for your ongoing support for this important work. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation today. And we're going to move back to Michael Rain because we were able to uh, secure contact with uh, him. Hi. My name is Barry Wise. 
Hi, how are you? Um, I, I like I like the bathroom bus to to I'd like to have more service on bathroom bus because going home going home is not uh, sometimes I have to wait too long. I had to wait too long for a bus. I took a cab home instead. What do you think? Hello? What do you think? I can hear you, so continue. Like I, I, like uh, I have, uh, I stand in there too long after I finish the doctor. Uh, uh, when I finish the foot doctor, I wait for a bus. I couldn't stand too long, so I had to flag a cab down. I had no choice standing at the bus stop no more than five minutes. Going, going south yesterday. Yesterday morning, they're they're so slow. They're so slow yesterday morning, but going north is 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 better. It's better. The service is better going north. Right, right. Okay. And I enjoy TTC. Yeah. I I enjoy being the TTC passenger. And and use Presto card. <laughs> Michael, thank you very much. Are you are you finished? Yeah, I finished now. Okay, well that's very nice uh, compliment to the TTC. Thank you for that. We're happy that you're a writer. And yeah, thank you. you have, uh, favorable things to say. Uh, is there any questions for Michael? Okay, Michael, thank you very much. You want to shut? How do I mute, mute myself? Uh, I'm not do sure. I, I think I'm the not clerk, sure. Either. I think the clerk will do that for you. Oh. Thank you, Michael. Moya Abiel is next from Scarborough Transit Action, and Moya, you have five minutes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. I can hear you, so you can proceed now. Chair, it looks like as if Moya fell off the line. We'll give her a call back. The next deputy in the list is Alan Yule. Hello, can everyone hear me now? And Sorry, uh, next slide. Sorry, Scarborough, but I regret to inform you that you will not be getting any new TTC rail projects for the next 40 years. This next slide, the next, this project had a completed EA done during the Miller years and it's still no further along than it was 11 years ago. Check the 2031 map from the previous agenda item. 2031 line five stops at Kennedy. It goes west, east does not happen. Next slide, please. The only exception is an extended number two. Next slide. Based on the opening dates of the line one extension to York region and projected opening date of line five, it is likely that this project won't open until 2033 ish. Next slide, please. The staff report recommends three options for your consideration, and they're listed in the report. Next slide, please. It may come as a surprise, but I have a fourth option for your consideration. Next slide, please. This line goes into operation sometime in 2022. This frees up a considerable number of Route 34 buses. Next slide, please. During non-rush hour, it takes about four minutes longer to get from Kennedy to Scarborough Center. Rush hour is likely six or more minutes longer than taking well, on the 903 versus taking the SRT. Next slide, please. Right now, we don't know for sure when in 22 this line will open, just that it should open in, 19, in, in 2022. Next slide, please. From now until 2023, we can look at possible route modifications to the 903 route and order more buses needed under option two. Next slide, please. 
doing a hybrid of 903 and route, uh, and route number three in 2023 will give us time to work the bugs out of the system. We keep both running in 2023 and keep and get the buses only in 2024. Keeping the SRT in service and a hybrid service in the 2024 gives us the best of a bad situation for service level in this section of Scarborough. We will also be in adherence with AOD accessibility requirements for 2025. Next slide, please. This, along with an enhanced frequent service map for routes in Scarborough, could help give this north part of Toronto the transit service it, de it deserves. Next slide, please. This is entirely east of Young TTC Board. 40% of the Scarborough Community Council is on the TTC Board. If Scarborough is ever going to get decent TTC transit, this is the board to do it. Thank you. Very much. Any questions? Okay, well, thank you for your presentation. Now we've got Moya back on the line. So uh, we'll move back to her. And you, Moya, if you can hear me, you've got five minutes and you can start now. Great. Hi. You can hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity. I am a volunteer with Scarborough Transit Action. Scarborough is a transit desert. Transit is so bad here that more than 80% of trips that start here are made by personal vehicle. For transit riders, two hour commutes are not in common. Love it or hate it, the SRT is the only bit of rapid transit that we have. And even then, it serves only 4% of all trips that begin in Scarborough. And thanks to you, our elected decision makers in the city and the province, our transit will become more horrible and life here will get worse. There'll be 60 more buses jostling for space on our crowded streets. We'll have even longer bus rides. More people will drive. Greenhouse gas emissions will increase. And you are responsible for the plan that led to this. And soon, a key reason for your decision to replace the SRT with a subway extension will disappear. Scarborough can't wait another 10 years for accessible rapid transit. We're calling for dedicated on-street bus lanes with zero emission buses, priority signaling, and frequent service to match best SRT service levels. The province should pay for the extra buses, frequent service, and fair integration between the TTC and GO network. But these are to be interim measures though. The SRT right-of-way must be preserved while other options are explored. And we're calling on you to recommend that other options for the SRT replacement be explored, including LRT and BRT. I have to point out that there has never been a comparison of all reasonable options for the SRT replacement. The business cases that were conducted deviated significantly from best practices. It's critical you look at this issue in the broader context. Scarborough is one of the poorest, most racialized parts of the city. Our people have been hard hit by the pandemic. The lack of rapid transit and its impact on poverty and health is an underlying reason for this. A transit network would allow people to get around Scarborough more easily. It would bring the jobs and housing that would build prosperity and health. It would build equity. And with many people working from home during the pandemic, the SRT's daily ridership has fallen to a third of its usual numbers. The people who are riding are the essential workers without the option to work from home. Lower ridership levels will likely continue after the pandemic as people continue their work from home arrangements. And this will further undermine the city's rationale for the subway extension. And we're facing another existential crisis, the climate emergency. Scarborough has the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions from personal vehicle use. And the most recent figures show that Toronto's emissions have gone up, not down. Toronto must accelerate efforts to meet its 2030 target. And effective public transit must be a central part of this effort. 
The pandemic and the climate emergency have already created an avalanche of unforeseen costs at all levels of government. The subway extension will cost us $6 billion, plus the additional $2 billion that it's added to the cost of the Eglinton East LRT. So that's $8 billion, 10 more years of waiting, seven years of longer bus rides, more frustration, more greenhouse gases, all for three stops that you still have to take a bus to get to. Can we not do better? For these reasons, we ask you to recommend that other options be considered for Scarborough's transit plan. We need a transit plan that's based on evidence. And now, more than ever, we must ensure that our money and our time is spent wisely and well. Thank you very much. Moya, any questions? I don't see any questions. Thank you again for your presentation. Our last uh, speaker today is Steve. Uh, from Municipal Transit Solutions, Steve Ostrowski. Steve, if you can hear me, you can start now with your five minutes. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Good afternoon, TTC Commissioners. Thank you for your time today. I am Steve Ostrowski, founder and CEO of Municipal Transit Solutions, located in Newmarket, Ontario. There is a fourth option to extend the service life of the Scarborough RT. It's called ultra light rail transit, which uses electric buses on rails to deliver LRT performance at BRT cost. The solution uses readily available technologies and all the existing infrastructure, like engineering and construction time, are crushed leading to the lowest cost and lowest risk option. The electric buses can be any commercially available brand, which are modified to use steel wheels for use on the rails and rubber tires for use on the road. There are no additional moving parts to perform the transition from rail to road and back. So winter reliability is the same as for an electric bus. This capability eliminates the need for switches and will be demonstrated in a formal budget and finance packaging stage of, an, of any of our implementation processes. Uh, the outstanding benefits of using ultralight rail for the SRT line are <clears throat> the conversion cost is estimated at $38.4 million, requiring no new funding. The implementation period is two years or less from feasibility study to operation allowing undisturbed community service. There will be no disruption of established roads or traffic loads, minimizing community disruption. Ultralight rail has the smallest carbon footprint by far for construction and the smallest carbon footprint for operating, minimizing environmental impact. It also offers the longest service life for use beyond 2030 so there would be no need to dismantle the RT line. ULRT allows for immediate electrification without the need for a charging barn due to the use of hybrid capacitor battery propulsion. These vehicles are already in production at Novabus, and three of them are scheduled for delivery to Brampton this year. The attached documents um, and if, if they can be put on screen, that would be great, the risk assessment, for example. The attached documents include ultralight rail transit as a fourth option in terms of financial cost and risk management. These financial figures and risk scores are currently estimates. With a request from the TTC to perform a feasibility study, the claims can be, excuse me, the claims can be substantiated with supporting data. I understand that these are extraordinary claims, and this is what would be a summary of the schedule of work that would be done for the Scarborough RT. Within three months, a preliminary feasibility study, including route and station assessments and a formal project budget would be completed. After six months, a financial two or three P structure would be ready 
and the on-off-rail technology demonstration will have been performed. After 12 months, route engineering would be completed and selective demolition would be done. That means we'll remove everything that's existing on the rail, uh, on the route uh, that's currently redundant or not needed. After 16 months, installation of one rail will be done in parallel to the RT operation and flash chargers will be installed. After 18 months, pilot route operation, testing, and commissioning of the ultralight rail vehicles will be completed. After 20 months, handover to the TTC for operation would be official. Typically, this action plan would be an oversimplification of what is to be done. In this case, it is exactly what is to be done. The reuse, and I emphasize this, the reuse of the existing infrastructure reduces the project activities to selective demolition and the installation of bolt-on new equipment. I asked the TTC to arrange a technology discovery session uh, for this option to be scrutinized by appropriate expertise, to vet any doubts regarding the ultralight rail technology option and the ability for MTS to deliver on these claims. On acceptance of this proposal, the ULRT risk and cost benefits can apply to all other transit expansion plans in Toronto. Thank you for your time, and I'll now respond to questions. Oh, thank you. Perfect timing. Um, do we have any questions for Steve? I have one from uh, Commissioner Lai. Go ahead, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for the uh, deputation. I just wanted to uh, ask that you had mentioned that uh, Brampton is going to be using this technology. Is that correct? Well, Brampton is purchasing... Um, the ultra light rail uh, transit. No, Br no Br Brampton is, is uh, purchasing the uh, vehicles that we would use on the ultra light rail. So um, the technology of the quick charging or flash charging exists and it's already uh, in, uh, on production uh, by Volvo uh, Nova Bus to deliver vehicles, those vehicles to Brampton. But the ultralight, those vehicles are not going to operate on rail. So basically this kind of technology, uh, who invented it? What, uh, is it? Is it a Canadian or is it a US or yes. I mean, uh, it, it is a Canadian I invention? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. MTS, MTS is exclusive. Uh, we actually developed the technology over the past four years thereabouts. And we're a consortium of firms. One of the uh, firms involved in the consortium uh, has extensive experience with LRT and mass transit engineering and uh, project management. So we do have um, the ability to deliver on what we're talking about. Uh, what other jurisdiction, according to you? I mean, uh, are you aware that I've been using this uh, this um, this uh, light uh, ultra light rail transit system? Other than this you know, Brampton is ordering the bus, the electric bus. What other jurisdiction this, this, are you aware of? Uh, allow me to explain. Uh, so, what we have here is an example of what I call a confluence of technologies that have been, for the first time, by MTS packaged in a way that makes for explosive value. Um, we are not a bus company and we are not operating in a bus silo. We are not a light rail company uh, operating in a rail silo. We're the first company, to my understanding ever, to take all of the benefits of an electric bus and by putting them on rails, get all the benefits of an LRT at a fraction of the cost and at a fraction of the construction time. And it's important to point out that the vehicles being electric buses, they are light enough for existing roads to support them. So when we talk about putting rails on roads, not in the case of the SRT, but in the case of any other routes, we've done a pilot study at least for Albany, um, we can put our rails and surface mount them so we do not interrupt or disrupt um, underground utilities. And that's, to my knowledge, is, uh, is, is new in, tech, in, uh, in transit. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Thank You're you. I don't see any other questions, so thank you for your presentation. That brings us to the end of deputations for today. 
Um, Commissioner Osborne had this item held. One question. Uh, would you like to go <laughs> first with your questions? Or, or I know you have, I know you want to speak, but would you have questions? Yes, I do. Okay, if you could go ahead. I've got a okay. list of people here for questions. Yeah. Um, so when I, a number of deputants have referred to this um, same sort of question that I have um, in among a number of other things. So I'd just like to highlight this. But when, when I was reading the material, I had this overwhelming all the way through it question about if it could be possible to convert the existing in SRT infrastructure, that right of way into a dedicated busway. And so I guess the question is, at, you know, at the highest level is, can it be done? The second question is, what is involved? And the third question would be, how fast could we reasonably expect to hear back from staff on the feasibility of this? Because there's no point in wasting any time if we can quickly determine that it isn't feasible. But if it is feasible, personally, I think it would be nice to know as quickly as possible the extent to which this is an option. So those are my questions. Uh, through you, Chair, I'll take that one. Uh, Comm Commissioner, it, uh, it is feasible, but what we would have to do is take that back and do a feasibility study to determine how long, what the cost would be, and then what the impact on that, and that area would be. I don't have that, you have that for today. Okay, you may not be able to answer this at all, but do we have any idea of the, the length of time that, that this, the feasibility part of it could take? So staff are telling me it could be up, to, uh, it could be six months more. Um, okay. we, we'll get back to you on that though. Thank you, That that's all I had. <clears throat> This is uh, Commissioner Bradford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks to all the deputants for, for joining us and providing their feedback today. A um, couple questions here for staff. Um, I want to start with how folks are moving in Scarborough, how they've been moving over the past number of years, and uh, any anticipated changes that we're seeing with mobility. Um, I think some of the findings that we see in Scarborough is a lot of folks focus on the trips from Scarborough to downtown, but there's actually a lot of travel that takes place within Scarborough. It's huge and there are a lot of inter Scarborough trips. So with respect to uh, transit demand management study, I know that the, the TTC and transportation planning folks had had undertaken one a few years ago. Uh, is the TTC or our transit planning group looking at updating the TDM study for Scarborough in light of some of the more recent changes we've seen with the pandemic and certainly where we are today and how people are moving. Scott, would you handle that if you wouldn't mind? Thank you. Yes, uh, certainly. Good afternoon uh, through the chair. Um, so we, we have a pretty good idea of how people travel in Scarborough. The, the line three Scarborough RT is really the spine of, of the central part of service in Scarborough. But of course, people make lots of different trips for lots of different purposes. And while our network is focused on line three, of course, there's lots of people that travel in other directions as well. Uh, it was mentioned in the previous item that the surface transit uh, enhancement study that's being done by the TTC in the city is looking at essentially improvements to all the major roads and all the major corridors across Scarborough. And so that's work we're participating in. And as you know, the rapid TO program has identified a number of key corridors that we need to work on. Uh, as well, the five-year service plan is coming up with some uh, pretty exciting new things uh, in the next year or so for the, the bus network in Scarborough. So there is a lot of work going on to make sure that we're always updating and improving the network uh, to better reflect how we see people traveling and how we think people will need to travel in the future. Okay, I don't wanna to burn too much of my time on this, but is a motion needed or can I be assured that there is new transit demand management study underway, looking at the circumstances right now and how that will interface with the challenges that we have on Scarborough RT, but more broadly moving, in, moving by transit in Scarborough uh, across the entire area? That is that is what we are doing and what we will specifically do for any replacement service for the Scarborough T and we'll do it in a general sense as well for the rest of Scarborough through the annual service plan process. Yes. Okay. When, when I read the report, um, it's it's quite astounding 
to uh, to contemplate 60 second headways that are going to be necessary uh, in order to accommodate the travel from the RT onto buses. That is very much a BRT level of service. Uh, if we do 90 second headways on our subways, we're now doing 60 seconds bus. That's bus going each direction 30 seconds. It's, it's wild to fathom that. Um, how does the TTC envision accommodating these vehicles on routes uh, and in particular around stations like, like Kennedy? That's going to be a huge challenge in itself. Uh, through the chair, yes, it will be a challenge. That is that is what we need to consult over the next year if the board directs us to do that today. Uh, we need to increase the capacity of Kennedy Station and Scarborough Centre Station bus bays, and we need to work with the city and with the community to talk about the, the level of transit priority that's necessary on those on those routes. We are agnostic as to what route the buses take. We just want to find the best, fastest, and most reliable way to move people. Is it possible that it might require a number of routes, a number of parallel routes, uh, to get people to where they need to go uh, at that volume and demand. But through the chair, yes, that's entirely possible, and that would be perfectly fine if we have to do that. Okay. Um, the report identifies the initial sort of costs on the SRT gap as 109 to $120 uh, million. Um, who's going to be paying for that, and how much of that cost could have been avoided? Uh, what metrics do we have at the TTC um, for our analysis at this stage? to ensure that the recommendations of uh, the Q3 report will will come forward um, with something that we can uh, that we can provide for. There's a hundred and twenty million dollar cost, okay? And I want to know who's paying for that, where that's budgeted, and what we are looking at between now and the Q3 report. Uh, to make sure that that we can afford that and deliver on this. So thank you, Commissioner, for that question. Uh, through the chair, I think through these uh, scenarios, what we've been able to identify is the funding that we do have available, which is essentially the 47 million for capital costs and the 200 ish million that we have for current service. Our intent would be to look at working with our partners with the province to look at how we can share and, and uh, uh, mitigate some of these costs. Um, we were only ever funded to ensure that we had the life uh, cycle extended uh, to a certain point in time. If you recall, the project, when it was funded by the city, was intended to deal with those costs um, for decommissioning and for the extension. So now that that project's been taken over by the province, we have to work with them to be able to look at how that these costs will get uh, funded. And if, if I recall from Bill 107, this was actually, that was a piece in the upload agreement that the TTC and the city would be working with the province to address these costs, additional service requirements uh, for the building of the, the Scarborough subway extension, anything to do with the SRT uh, and buses that might be needed to, to, uh, to help fill gaps on service until that was completed in 2030. Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, thanks, Ms. Levita. Thanks, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Commissioner McKelvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so my first question is about, what is the total capacity of the SRT in terms of the number of passengers that it can, it can take? Because, I mean, you haven't added more trains onto it in the last however many decades, right? So what is that total number? Uh, through the chair, we, we carry 35 to 40,000 people a day, and, and the peak hour ridership is in the three to 4,000 persons per hour per direction. And you're correct, we have not added service in recent years. In fact, we run one or two trains fewer in recent years. Okay, so um, we've known for some time that we're going to need to somehow increase capacity for that travel route, right? Uh, through the chair, essentially, yes, we, we have had a capacity problem on that line for quite a number of years. Okay. Um, so my next question is um, I, earlier. Earlier, um, councillors and commissioners asked about studying the the bus lanes on in the existing corridor. So I was happy with that answer. Um, but some of the deputants talked about the SRT lands, and that they were worried about those lands being ceded to the province. Like I didn't see anything about this in the report. Like is that a real? It, was that in the report? Where is this coming from? Or what needs to be done in this regard? 
Gary Downey, do you want to answer that in the context yeah. of the project? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, the current contract that Metrolinx has is for the demolition only. The city still owns the land that the, the SRT is built on, so the city will retain the land going forward. And again, if we want to look at a BRT on that, we can do that. Okay, okay. So so we have, um, so sorry, it was the, de the demolition once we were no longer using that route or corridor is what is in Metrolinx's purview. Yes, that is through the chair. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, and then as for the two options, two versus three, um, and this acquisition of new buses versus not acquiring new buses. So why wouldn't we need to acquire new buses? Do we have that many buses that are sitting around that they could accommodate this at any time? Like, I don't understand how, how that's an option. <laughs> I'll take that through you, Chia. What we did is we looked at the age of the existing fleet and all the new buses that we've generated in, into the fleet in the last four years. And because we didn't have the money identified in the existing 10-year capital budget, right, I looked at an option where could we go down to a 16% spare ratio for two or three years while we work with other levels of government to get the additional funding to build that back up. So it's an option, and as you're aware, uh, with the RFP going out later on this year, we're going to have about 300 hybrid buses coming in, uh, in in that time frame. So we'll be doing a turnover of the fleet and additions. So we have a good number of buses that'll be coming in. So I, I was trying to bridge the gap there while we have that discussion for funding. It doesn't mean that if we if we come get funding that we couldn't buy brand new buses right away, but we have that we've given ourselves that option with the increase in the recent years. Okay, so so really that's that's an escape clause should you not be able to secure additional funding for the buses. Okay, noted. Um, as for many deputants have spoken to, um, should these new buses be electric um, and that they would like to see that these buses are the cleanest possible, what is the timeline for making an electric bus order given that you're still waiting on the data on the performance of the three different manufacturers? Uh, Bem Case, can you answer that one? Rich, do you have that timeline? Um, yeah, um, through the chair. Um, I don't have the timeline in front of me, but um, um, we, the electric bus um, manufacturers are all on board. So given the um, the the assessment in April that we're going to put forward. Um, I think the time um, the time to decide after that is pretty quick in terms of um, reliability. We'd have to look at also uh, potentially doing on, on route charging if we're going to use the same right away that the SRT uses. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. There. No, it does. So, so this delay in new orders then we may be able to do that, and then that would also help us to ensure that those new vehicles are electric. So that would give us. Yes. Yeah, so number. there's. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the the challenges at the current moment is the charging system. Um, we are seeing good results on the charging system at the moment. Um, however, we have to still look at the overall service plan and uh, how many hours it needs to be out there without um, the current charging system. So if it doesn't, uh, uh, if it doesn't. Uh, conform to the existing uh, battery um, capacities that we have now, then we'd have to look at on route charging um, on the infrastructure itself. And then, sorry, I'm sneaking in one more question. I'm going to talk really fast. Um, does this analysis that you've done take into account the vehicles that will be freed up when the crosstown opens? And that's my last question, sorry. Uh, I believe it does, but I'll, I'll defer to Scott. Through the chair, yes, you're correct. It does take that into account. Thank you. Next is uh, Commissioner Lai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, staff, for this um, report. And I just wanted to have a couple of questions. There are three recommendations here. Do we have to make a decision today to what option we're going to be taking? Anybody answer that question? Yeah, through the chair. Yeah, th there's actually two options we're, we're wanting to take forward as part of the recommendation, and that's the two bus options. Uh, again, we've been uh, 
some of the commissioners have already asked if we would look at a third option, which is a BRT, and would look at that as part of the options analysis as well. Rick mentioned it would take a, roughly six months to look at that as well. So we'll take that into consideration as the option analysis going forward. And, and I read the second question I have is, I read somewhere that you're going to be conducting public consultations. And uh, has this been consulted with the public? I mean, for, for this staff report, for this report, has any been, you know, any of these deputants, you know, some of the ideas that they have, they have proposed. And, uh, you know, I got a couple of emails about uh, other options that we can have. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, when you're writing this report, uh, had, had those consultations be taken in consideration? Uh, Scott here through the chair. Uh, we have not yet because we are awaiting the direction of the board on this matter, but we are ready to go with consultation. We've heard lots of good ideas and, and, and no good stone will left, be left unturned. I see. My final cap uh, question, I guess, would be, uh, I think you've answered it somewhat, but I just want to confirm that I heard it right, is about the option two, about the uh, $375 million. And you said that uh, is it in the capital funding? Is it, or or do we are we waiting for other governments to uh, to chip in? So, through the chair, in terms of option two, yes, um, yeah. what we have funding for is the the balance of the costs associated with the with the life cycle extension. It's for only forty seven million dollars. Any how much? Money? Sorry, forty forty seven million dollars. Forty seven million. Okay. Yes. And, and and so and, in, in any of these options, um, the capital costs exceed the $47 million. And so we would have to be working with our, our provincial partners to, to look at funding sources. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions, Madam Chair. Commissioner Lalonde, I just want to clarify if you wanted to speak. I thought. Yes, I do. Yeah, could you go ahead now, please? Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, let me preface my questions with um, the statement that I'm not convinced that we should be abandoning option one in, in this analysis. And my questions will, will show why that is. So on the financial analysis, uh, I guess I wanted to ask about four things being incorporated into that financial analysis. The first is, have we incorporated the prospect of a potential delay in the Scarborough subway extension? Because under these options, we actually save $18 million a year in operating costs. So if the subway is delayed, we may actually have some benefit from going with option one. Uh, second question, um, have we tried to factor in anything related to the deferral on the subway extension cost and the cost of that money that we're saving or someone's saving? Um, you know, there, there's been approval for a three and a half billion dollar subway extension that isn't happening right now. And the fact that it's being delayed by 10 years or so affords us a, a financial benefit that we've not tried to incorporate in this analysis, or I'm asking whether we have. Uh, thirdly, have we tried to incorporate anything on productivity costs for the millions of riders that use this system and the five or 10 minutes a day that they're going to lose by going to the other options? Uh, that has some value. Have we incorporated that any, anyway? And then finally, uh, have we incorporated the full cost of options two and three because of the discussion that's happening today? It sounds like we're, we're expecting that there'll be enhancement to bus services beyond what's included in the analyses, busways or more buses or uh, special lanes, all of which have financial ramifications. Have we incorporated any of that into the options to make them uh, fully comparable to option one? Those are my questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, we'll have staff respond. Um, I, I can, to the chair, I can, I can start with the answer to that. So, in terms of, to me, if I take your last question first about the option two, um, it does. It, 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 so, obviously, it does not include anything about making, uh, like, for example, we heard about the SRT um, becoming a, a kind of a special busway. Obviously, that's not included. But it does include costs about making changes to um, Kennedy and Scarborough Center uh, stations to accommodate the number of buses that would be going through there and some um, traffic priority measures um, based on the plan of option two and uh, two and three as it was outlined. So that that piece is covered. Um, some of the other items that you mentioned, 
um, I, I think generally speaking, um, those those items are not included. Thank you. This is Commissioner Carroll. Thanks, Madam Speaker. And, and that worked out because I, I, I just wanted to follow along uh, on uh, uh, Commissioner Lalonde's line because we're looking here at finishing service. If we go with one of these options, we're looking at finishing service in 2023 or 2026. Through the chair, through, through the chair we're, we're looking to stop the service in 2023 and replace it with a bus service at that point in time. That, so that's, that's the op sorry, so that, that's the optimum that time for us to make that change because that's the time it will take us to get the infrastructure in place. We looked at the program to, you know, get the infrastructure both at, at Kennedy and Scarborough plus the bus lanes and we look at that. That's that's what we believe is a feasible program to get till then. And again, what you've got what we've got what we took into consideration is about the reliability of the SRT. We wanted to put a reliable service in place as quick as quickly as we possibly could. And that was as right. quick as we could do that. So the reason I ask this is is I, I'm 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 in the same boat as Commissioner Lalonde. Well, while the direction it says proceed to further study on two and three, on on option one, the the idea of a hybrid that we might continue to do the SRT for a few years, but begin to build in this bus network. That's the way I read option one. The reason I ask about that is is you know we did the major life extension in 2012 when when we realized we weren't going to proceed with construction of the lrt then we did more work around 2018 we started more work apparently i think i remember it wasn't wasn't as exhaustive a life life extension but 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 a lot of work on on the vehicles and the and the and a bit on the track and at that time in the 2018 i i remember them saying this could go till 2026 and then that's it. So, so 2026 is no longer possible. Yeah. I'll take that through you, Chair. You are right. The overhauls of the work that they did in 2012 and around 2018, that was uh, the selective overhaul work around safety and accessibility it had never touched right. anything to do with reliability. And that's the point that we have right here. Could we nurse the system till 2026? The answer is yes. Right. Will the reliability be there with the way that system is operating today? As you can see in the report, the projections of going down. Right. So even if we took the opportunity to uh. try to go get new vehicles, or upgrade these vehicles. All right. The time frame to do that and the cost to do that, we'll have to bust the line uh, along the way either way, as well as, well as busing in uh, for AODA in, in 2026. So my fear was, when we were making the recommendations, is trying to keep it going longer with the poor quality of service that they're getting today, knowing that it can only go in one direction because we can't guarantee that the pristine reliability that we know we can do with other, other modes. And that's why we, we said we cannot go any farther. And one of the things that we didn't press okay. on this report is when we get other funding from other levels of government, there's a residual value for a bus that goes beyond 2030. Right. Okay. With anything, we, anything we go. So we're in these discussions with, I don't mean to take up your time, Commissioner. I apologize. Yeah, no, yeah, because I got one more. <laughs> so, so that's, so, so I get it. So you wouldn't be able to get to 2026 without some re reliability based overhaul. My other question is about the lands, because uh, that was very interesting that the, the deputy who talked about that. And I'm wondering, it sounds like you've negotiated that in all of this change over to, Metrolinx took over the the project of a, a Scarborough subway, and you seem to have negotiated they would do demolition on on the RT, uh, uh, you know, bricks and mortar, and and good on you. That's a good negotiation because it's nowhere near their new alignment. However, um, do we have to 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 go with their timing? Could we not? Could we not say, okay, that's a negotiated point, and that's great, but at the moment we need to continue to talk to the community about about what happens in those lands in those areas because it it might affect how we go about the demolition mightn't it through you chair you're absolutely right we're in discussions with them regarding the demolition the removal of that area all right and what it was said to them is recognizing the time frame that they no longer have to uh start that in the 2030 time frame was originally they thought possibly we could get to the 2030 time frame 
so there's the time value of money they could start this much sooner for demolition purposes while we work with the city to find out what we could do for capital funding what do we want that area to be in 2013 council actually gave direction to the city to do a review of some type of skyline you may recall all right where it could be a walkway or walking path and um so or, sure, or, or, or ex exactly so there's opportunities here that we could incorporate in part of our, our review for what potentially that could be in the future. Thanks, Madam Chair, those are my questions. Okay, um, I think that's all of our questions. So we'll move to speakers, unless I'm wrong. I wanna make sure everybody got an opportunity to ask questions. So I'm gonna move on, unless you holler. And the first person to speak on this item is Commissioner Osborne, so go ahead. Um, yes, I am very grateful that um, there's an interest in pursuing this third option just to see if it is feasible to get a busway so that we can offer um, at least in part unimpeded by traffic option to the citizens who are about to lose that. Um, so I know that uh, Rick said that they were going to look into it and um, Councillor Carol and I or Councillor Bradford and I have um brewed up a, a joint um motion here um so shall i read it or okay uh moving that staff be directed to include a brt or busway on the srt right of way as part of the replacement transit service options analysis including signal priority measures receive input and feedback on it through the community engagement process, including any necessary changes to the city's surface transit network plan priorities and report back to the board as part of the Q3 board report. Okay, uh, any other comments on that? Uh, we'll, we'll move to our next speaker, which is Commissioner Bradford. Thanks very much, Madam Chair, and um, thank you to Commissioner Osborne for, for moving that as well. Uh, I think this is certainly, uh, since the report kind of dropped last week, something that we've all been mulling over and talking about and uh, certainly top of mind. Um, so it's good to see us proceeding uh, with taking a look at the existing corridor and what we can do there. Um, Madam Chair, I also have uh, two motions, if we can just put them on the screen here, uh, that I would like to move. Uh, the first is asking our CEO to start a conversation with the province and Metrolinx for those extra costs that, uh, that, are, that are going to be incurred uh, given the SRT is at end of life and uh, we don't have any of that new transit built yet. Uh, and the second motion is asking TTC staff to work with the City of Toronto to make sure that we're engaging proactively uh, with the city's communities, with, with, um, uh, with our neighborhood improvement areas and the groups are going to be uh, significantly impacted by the, the changes coming forward. Uh, Councillor Lai had some good questions to that extent as well. So uh, meant to address that. Um, I, you know, and, and, and thirdly, the, the recommendation uh, that Commissioner Osborne moved here, um, you know, yeah. the idea that we look at every option for the SRT uh, where we're running buses in the corridor as an interim measure. I think that's going to be really important. Um, Madam Chair, as we heard from deputants today, um, the news on the decommissioning of the SRT, uh, that's not particularly surprising, uh, but I don't think it makes it any less disappointing for our TTC customers. Um, you know, the Scarborough transit saga uh, continues, and I think it's fair to say, if we're going to be honest, we're a long way out from the improved transit service uh, that our customers and residents have been promised for many decades. Um, if we're bringing buses uh, every 60 seconds, as the report suggests, uh, that's 30 seconds each way, um, we are talking about bus rapid transit. That's BRT. And while this is a great option in the interim, uh, we're definitely going to have to make sure that we have all the nuts and bolts in place so that these bus routes function to move people around as quickly as possible and that we are prioritizing transit. This is going to be a big step and uh, for our city because uh, a lot of the time there are trade-offs and, and we as a commission have talked about this at our, with our work on uh, bus priority transit corridors. This is going to be a conversation very much the same. 
where we're talking about uh, limited right of way and defined spaces. And as a commission for our customers and as a city, we are going to make uh, decisions where we prioritize transit and we prioritize moving people. And that's going to be a tough conversation, but one where a lot of um, uh, a lot of consultation and work with the community and work with all our different agencies is going to be needed to achieve that. Um, I think that this post SRT uh, plan needs to move as quickly as possible to ensure that what we've decided for implementation uh, can be put in place uh, before the operation of the SRT closes. While we talk about 2023 and end of life, um, it sort of seems a few years off, of course, but that is going to happen very quickly when we're considering the size, the scope, and the magnitude of the changes that, that are going to be needed. Even, even when we're looking at the stations of Scarborough Town Center and Kennedy and all the work that is going to be needed um, to upgrade that and accommodate this sort of BRT level service uh, in stations that are not, not prepared or equipped to deal with that, that's going to be a tremendous amount of work. So, uh, you know, my hope and aspiration to our competent t team at the TTC to get that going uh, that's going to be really important. Um, you know, I think we're here, of course, because uh, conversations about transit planning uh, often end up being political, and, and we've had decades and decades of those discussions. Um, I think that the, you know, the challenges that we're facing today are, are a direct result of that. But right now, we as a commission, we as a city, uh, need to make the best of a challenging situation. Uh, and I would like to thank all of the deputants today, my fellow commissioners uh, who we've had lots of conversations with and are very much seized with this issue, as well as our TTC staff, transit planning, transit expansion office. Everyone is going to have to come together uh, to minimize the disruption of these impacts, introduce a BRT level of service uh, that responds to, to the transit demand and, and shifting demand and transportation patterns in Scarborough and help bridges the gap uh, between now and 2030, where we can, fingers crossed, uh, move forward with the Scarborough subway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions on your motions, so we're gonna move on um, to our next speaker, who is uh, Commissioner Lai. Chair, I, don't, I didn't put my name down to speak, sorry. Just a question. Please? Okay, my apologies. No uh, I got a note that you did, so I'm going to move on to Commissioner Lalong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to point out that I think an analysis comparing rapid transit to buses is not the right analysis. Uh, if we're going to subject all of our subway planning to comparison against bus routes, we'd never build a subway uh, in the city. So I think the uh, both the city and the province have already committed that uh, rapid transit in, in Scarborough is important and something that we're going to build. Uh, so it strikes me that the comparisons we should be making now are what are our short-term options for rapid transit uh, in, in Scarborough. So I support um, Commissioner Osborne's motion that uh, around BRTs, because I think that is you know, one of the options that might be available to us. I don't think we should abandon the SRT option uh, while we're investigating these options, because I think it, it behooves us to come back with a rapid transit option until we have subways in Scarborough. And from a cost point of view, even if that ends up being 100 or $200 million more than, uh, than the bus option, I would say so be it. That, um, you know, we, we, as I said, we have committed to rapid transit. And compared to a three and a half billion dollar price tag to put a subway in, anything that we do for the next 10 years is gonna look like a bargain by comparison. So um, I, I didn't prepare a motion on this, but I would actually encourage staff to continue to investigate the SRT extension option during the consultation period. As I said, I'd be supporting uh, Commissioner Osborne's motion to look at BRT options. And if there are any other rapid transit options that might exist, I would encourage staff to, to pursue those as well before we make a final decision on this in a few months time. Sorry, Chair, I think you were muted. 
I'm sorry. Thank you for your remarks. Um, we're going to move now to Commissioner Carroll. Madam Speaker, I, I submitted a motion kind of late. I don't know if Chris Ann has had time to type it up. I can speak to other parts of the topic in the meantime. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, I, I moved this motion because I, I, I think I think it it keeps it short, but it does it does also in its uh, in its uh, function of asking us to consult. It does actually slow us down from from dispersing these lands, uh, maybe handing them over to create ATO. I think, I think we really ought to wait on that. Um, there is a potential here to look at this as, you know, but some people might not think of it as highest and best use, but, but even if we just took Ellesmere and, and Lauren station, for instance, and looked at them as possible mini bentways, why shouldn't something like that be happening for us in the suburbs? So I'm so pleased that, that, uh, that the uh, the deputant today brought that up and and got our imagination going. As to the to the report, Madam uh, uh, Speaker, it it kind of mirrors uh, uh, my whole career from the first time I asked a silly rookie question. Um, you know, one of my earliest budget briefings where I was sitting in a room in my first term with with David Soknacki, who was budget chief at the time, and David Miller. Um, they were talking about okay. Number one, we we got to deal with that uh, that SRT. Uh, times are wasting. The replacements coming in 2012. This is 2004, so it starts there. And and as it happens, they, so they were building it into the 10 year plan at that point and putting placeholders for dollars. And and if not a replacement, then then an overhaul. And oh my gosh, that was going to cost so much. And. Uh, and I looked up, there were only three year terms and I said, that's three terms away. Can we maybe park that and, and deal with the immediate? Cause there were plenty of difficult needs in the TTC. And they looked at me like, oh, you silly rookie. You have no idea how long it takes to do things in transit. At that time, we were being told in, in 2004, an overhaul in 2000 that, that has been done right around amalgamation. It's only going to last so long. We need to replace that thing, replace the whole thing by 2012. And that really was the germination of the discussion about Transit City, because as they started to look at new options and new vehicles and what could be built in the way of LRT on top of that RT infrastructure, started to realize maybe that's the suburban map of higher order transit writ large. And that, you know, germinated that discussion. Um, we all know how that uh, turned out. And so in 2012, post overhaul, uh, and, and that line not being on its way, because any subway takes a good 12 years. If you, if you change midstream, not going to do that. Now we're going to do this in higher order transit. You're looking at a period of about 12 years from your brilliant idea to in service. And so here we are now trying to, to bridge the gap from, from 2012, changing our minds all the way to 2026. And so, so uh, there's been the overhaul in 2000, the overhaul in, in, before I even got here, then one in 2012, then some other changes around 2018 as we were going out the door for the election. What we're learning is option one, um, if we were going to keep it going and do a hybrid, we got to do. We got to put more money. And my my grandmother would have called that throwing good money after bad. Uh, you know, there's only so much you can really effectively overhaul something, and then you're really sticking it together with with chewing gum. And that's that's where this system has got. And the riders feel it. They talk about it all the time. The unreliability comes from the shape it's in that they can they can hear with their own ears and they can feel as they ride it. So. We have to move on this, um, but we hear the pain from the from the uh, uh, deputants because they know this is going to be very, very difficult for them. Um, I take some solace from the, the bus map and I hope folks have had a look at it. I predict that if we run um, uh, a, a map as efficient as that with lots of 900 series on it and headway such as uh, the report describes and Councillor Bradford, Bradford just, just described, one thing we know is that when we complete the Scarborough subway, those deputies will be back to say, do not take away any of these RT replacement bus services because they actually go far beyond uh, uh, anything that, that, that the subway itself is going to be able to, uh, to serve uh, they, and, and very efficiently the way, the way it's drawn up in this map. And so if you consider 
that probably the subway out of all these lines, that Scarborough subway is probably the province's biggest priority. And if that's the case, if, if things mess up, there's drift everywhere and that's the only thing they built, but we have fortified it with the bus network that's proposed in, in two and three, then I think that, uh, I think that what we'll find is uh, 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 that bus network stays people will become used to the fact that one long 900 series bus can get them from Scarborough U of T very quickly to Kennedy. Those types of, of uh, uh, changes are, are groundbreaking. And the, the question is going to be to be able to do it with as little disruption as possible. Um, for the consultations, I think having sort of stations within the consultation so that we really are as our deputy from Scarborough U of T said, take a cohort approach to consultation. So you're getting riders in the room and talking about the rider changed experience. Drivers will be in the room. What's the driver changed experience? But to have an added station that looks at what is the potential of the lands where we're gonna be finished using. What do you wanna do under that overpass on Ellesmere, under that overpass in Lawrence? What sort of interesting things could we do? It will it will take the sting out of what is going to be a real sacrifice on the part of riders and drivers in, in Scarborough as we do this work. So I look forward to, to that and I'll, I'll be there at those consultations. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Thank you. I don't believe there's anybody else on the speakers list. Oh, okay. I did not know. Commissioner McKelvey, you're up next. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there is no surprise here for transit users in Scarborough. I grew up at Victoria Park in Lawrence. I took the RT out to Scarborough Town Center. And then I moved to Midland and Lawrence because I wanted to be on the RT line um, so that I can, could commute downtown. And in the mornings, it was often full by the time I got to Lawrence Station. And I would go north a few stops to cross over to go to get back into Kennedy. So for decades, we've known that it's at capacity and it has no potential for growth or to add more trains onto it. So I look at this and say, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Well, one is transit along that actual corridor. But in my mind, I think we have a second issue that we need to solve through this study. And that's about increasing capacity to move people through that corridor as well. And so as we look towards moving to bus rapid transit options and express buses, I think we need to keep that in mind, that it is about drawing those people back that have walked away from the Scarborough RT. And in fact, I moved um, from that area because I was frustrated by it. And then I moved out to Port Union Lawrence so that I could take the GO train downtown instead. And I think that that, that walk away from the, the RT has happened for many, many different residents because frankly, they're tire, tired of the service reliability uh, standing on Kennedy Station in the cold, it's not fun. It's cold up there, and sometimes that train breaks down, and then you've wasted that time waiting for it. So I think we have two issues to solve. There's transit along the corridor, but we also just can't forget that this is also an opportunity to increase capacity and bring people back uh, to this line that, that many have deserted in the first place. Um, I'd like to thank the other commissioners who've brought forward some excellent motions here today. I'm happy to support all of those. I think it is interesting and worth looking at um, bringing rapid transit, bus rapid transit along that corridor, either at grade or elevated. Um, and, uh, and, you know, hopefully we can find a solution here that, that, you know, while it will take longer, and I think nobody, nobody looks forward to that, but we can bring some people back on, onto this transit route as well. So um, thank you to staff for, for their good work. Um, trying to keep this going as long as they have. Um, I imagine I'd like to see the bill for duct tape and twist ties at some point. I, I imagine it's enormous. Um, thank you so much. Okay, uh, I'm going to say a few words unless there's anybody else who wants to. I'm going to keep it very brief because I think it's all been said. Um, I do want to start by thanking all of the deputants uh, that joined us today. Uh, we did have some technical difficulties, but we actually were able to connect with every single deputant in the end. And uh, it's a very important issue to Scarborough and, quite frankly, the whole city. And uh, I thought the deputants um, presented beautifully, like really insightful comments and um, very passionate and um, knowledgeable. So that was interesting to listen to those today. Um, we really do appreciate your insights and nobody knows uh, the issues like you right on the ground. Um, you're there experiencing it. So it's uh, really helpful for the commissioners to hear your comments. Um, 
years ago, I think it was almost a decade, I can't believe it, but I did, uh, Royce and James interviewed me about transit discussions at City Hall, and I was a rookie, uh, similar to Councillor Carol, Carol's story, and I remember um, him quoting me as saying, you know, transit seems to be a political football in the city. Um, boy, was I right uh, many years ago. And um, I'm pretty sure that uh, the Scarborough subway could make it into the Guinness Book of World Records for the number of times that this has been before council. Like it's, I, I've lost count. I've lost count. I did at one point have a count on it, but I've lost, so I've given up. So um, I just think nobody wanted to see this come to this point, and here we are. Uh, so we have to um, charge ahead with these comprehensive community consultations um, and this outreach plan. And my understanding is it's going to be exhaustive. It, there's going to be phone surveys. There's going to be online surveys. Um, we're going to be using social media. Uh, there's going to be a website, etc. cetera. So um, there, there's going to be a big plan rolled out to ensure those consultations are, as I said, connecting with the right people, as well as um, communicating and um, giving people a voice on this issue. So we are not making a final decision today, but what we are doing is narrowing our focus on the most feasible option and to ensure we can lay out the best possible plan to provide reliable transit service on this critical corridor. And I want to uh, let you know that I'm supporting all the motions before us today. I, I want to thank Commissioner Osborne. I think it was great. She was uh, proactive in crafting this motion. In fact, she, I think she had it submitted even yesterday. That's how organized she was. Um, I want to hear what the, obviously, what the Scarborough councillors have to say about her concept, uh, what she's putting forward. It's very important to hear their thoughts on that. But thank you to Commissioner Osborne. Um, and we need to do our due diligence and explore every possible option to provide, as I said, reliable and effective transit service to the residents of, of Scarborough. Um, I don't need Councillor Commissioner Bradford to remind me uh, that when they uploaded all of the lines and the majority of the network, the province of Ontario, we were very clear about costs associated with that. And that it was very clear that they would cover the costs. So let's not forget that for one minute. And I appreciate Councillor Bradford uh, highlighting that today because I will not forget that mo those motions and, th and that, uh, that position that the city took that you're doing this, then you're gonna pay for all the costs associated with it. So uh, let's keep that top of mind. And um, let's move now to the motions that are before us. We'll have them put up on the screen. Um, one by one and uh, vote on those. And then we have one more item before us today with three deputants. So the first um, item here uh, before us, the first motion is an amendment is from Commissioner Osborne. So all in favor, opposed? Can I recorded vote on this one? Oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll pass the baton to the clerk. Commissioner Bradford. Favor. Commissioner Carroll. In favor. Vice Chair De Laurentiis. In favor. Commissioner Jagdio. In favor. Commissioner Lai. In favor. Commissioner Lalonde. In favor. Commissioner McKelvey. In favor. Commissioner Minim Wong. Commissioner Minim Wong. Sorry, I believe he's absent, my apologies. Commissioner Osborne. In favor. Chair Robinson. Chair Robinson. Chair Robinson. In favor? Can you hear me? In favor. Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. The motion carries with nine in favor uh, and Commissioner Minim Wong absent. To the next motion, which are Council, uh, Commissioner Bradford's motions. Uh, they were shown earlier and he spoke to them. 
So um, if, uh, if the recorded vote is not necessary, uh, I would ask all those in favor of Commissioner Bradford's motions. Opposed? That carries. We'll move now to Commissioner Carroll's motion. It's on the screen. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. So those are the uh, motions, the amendments. Um, and so now we need a motion on the staff recommendations that are before us. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner McKelvey. Okay, she, uh, Commissioner McKelvey is moving the staff recs. Uh, all those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Okay, we have now completed that item. We'll move to our last item for today. And that is the item on the fair pass. And so it's item um, 11, City Council Transmittal Economic Development Culture, sorry, Economic and Community Development Committee, Fair Pass Program 2020 update. And um, I don't know if there's any questions on this, but I know Commissioner Lai has a motion on this item. Chair, we have three deputants. Oh, yeah. I'm the one who told you that earlier and forgot about it, gosh. All right, let's move to the deputants. So we have three. Um, and um, if you could introduce them and connect them, please, uh, uh, Chris Ann. Certainly, Chair. The first deputant is Jasmine Mohammed. Go ahead, Jasmine. Good afternoon, TTC board members. My name is Jasmine Mohammed, and I'm with TTC Riders. TTC Riders is a membership organization of transit users. When the first phase of the Fair Pass was launched in 2018, TTC Riders works with a variety of agencies and individuals who receive Ontario Works and the Ontario Disability Support Program to promote the program, support people to sign up, and conduct a survey about barriers to accessing the Fair Pass. We are pleased that the Fair Pass applications are resuming and that TTC will work with social development, finance, and administration and use the five-year fair policy review process to exercise, streamline, and reduce barriers for residents to fully apply for the fair sessions and the fair pass discount. However, changes have already been made to the fair pass application process that will limit people's access to transit discount. We urge you to implement the following recommendations as soon as possible. The City of Toronto should offer in-person fair pass sign-up options and offer sign-up clinics with the Metrolink so that fair pass cards can be applied for, validated, and loaded on the spot. The multiple steps to obtain a card, apply to the program, load a card, and validate it, it creates ba barriers for potential FairPass users. People without online access can only load their cards at subway stations or shoppers' drug marts, which are not within walking distance for many residents, especially in suburban neighborhoods. Currently, Presto cards must be validated within 30 days. The city is requesting that Metrolinks allow real-time validation of cards during the online or phone FairPass application process, but there must be an interim solution. Shifting the application process to online and phone will make it easier for some applicants, but those without online or phone access will fall through the cracks. The FairPass Phase 1 evaluation report in 2019 found that majority of cardholders heard about the program in person at a test application center, ODSP office, or through a test-produced card or flyer in the mail. That's 13%. These findings suggest that direct in-person communication with staff may be the best method for this type of program. Other barriers identified in the 2019 Phase 1 report include language barriers and confusion about where, load, where to load funds. The city should also offer the option of sending program validated presto cards by mail to ensure access to the program. The Fairfax Phase 1 evaluation report found that the majority of residents, approximately 75%, who were eligible to choose to receive the Fairfax via mail as uh, Presto cards should be free for everyone. Lastly, the Fair Pass discount must be rolled out faster to low-income residents. A full rollout of the program to all-income Torontonians has been delayed. This is unacceptable, especially during a pandemic when low-income residents are depending on transit the most. The Fair Pass Program 2020 update report notes that in September 2020, compared to January 2020, the decline in ridership for Fair Pass users was 37% compared to a 61% decline for non-fair pass TTC users. In conclusion, TTC riders urges you to offer in-person sign-up options, mail program, and validated cards to eligible user users and fully implement the fair pass program. Thank you for listening. Very much, any questions? 
Okay, so thank you. Um, I think we're going to move to, we have two more speakers. So um, if we could ask Chrisanne to connect the next speaker. Thank you. The next deputant is Keitha Senkumaran Navratnam. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, members of the TDC board. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. My name is Kaylee Sekmaran Navaratnam, and I'm a member of TDC Riders, which is a membership organization of Transa Riders. In November 2020, TDC Riders made a deputation to the Economic and Community Development Committee and also submitted a written communication outlining the equity, accessibility, and technical barriers of the Fair Pass program. We are encouraged to see that the report before you today recommends to identify, streamline, and reduce barriers for residents to fully apply for the Toronto Transit Commission's fair concessions and the fair pass discount. I would like to share some of the barriers to accessing the fair pass that we know exist in addition to the recent changes the previous dependent highlighted. The city also studied the first phase of the fair pass in 2019 and released a report, but many of those learnings and recommendations haven't been implemented. During the pandemic, it became very clear that the fair pass recipients rely on it more than other users. Ridership dropped by 61 percentage, whereas 37 percentage for the fair pass riders. Therefore, expanding the fair pass program is an important way to get more riders back on the system. We are deeply concerned that the full rollout of the discount is being delayed indefinitely. The city also must act on removing access barriers that were identified in 2019. The pace for an evaluation report documented many barriers to accessing and using the fair pass that have not yet been addressed. One key barrier is the different light and sound emitted when concession cards are tapped. This has disproportionately impacted Indigenous people's fair pass usage, according to the report. Some eligible people decline to apply for the discount due to potential stigma, embarrassment and interaction with fair inspectors. Another key barrier is difficulty accessing presto technology in suburban areas. Half of cardholders who participated in the in-depth evaluation report interviews said that they would like to be able to load the affair pass at other locations, specifically mentioning convenience stores, grocery stores, and banks, as well as on buses and in streetcars. A 19 percent said that they were unsure or unaware of the different places that they could load money on their card. We would also like the TTC to be free for people who receive Ontario Works and Ontario Disability Support Program and on extreme weather alert days. The cost of the fare is, is still unaffordable for people who receive Ontario Works, which is about $733 per month for a single person, and Ontario Disability Support Pro Program, which is about $1,169 per month. Currently, Ontario Works and ODSP recipients are not eligible for the Fair Pass program if they receive transportation supports greater than $100. This has created confusion about who is eligible. Phase 1 evaluation report found that 37% of people could not afford even if they were eligible. Free TTC for social assistance recipients would also ensure more seamless, equitable access for suburban residents who lack internet access or online banking to reload presto cards. Some drop-ins have TTC tokens available on extreme cold alert days, but these are of little use to individuals who are relying, who are trying to get to a shelter or drop-in. Jury recommendation number 22 of the Grand Faulkner Inquest states that Toronto should, quote-unquote, advocate to the Toronto Transit Commission and Metrolinks to emphasize the importance of ensuring appropriate access to transportation for individuals who are homeless and consult with members of the Scarborough community when it is considering these issues to ensure that the transition to presto technology does not create barriers. During the pandemic, it is more urgent than ever to ensure that everyone can access safe public transportation. To conclude, I urge the TTC board to fully implement the Fair Pass program, remove stigmatizing technical procedures, increase access to Presto, and make transit free for those who receive Ontario Works and Ontario Disability Support Program, and needing to take transit on extreme weather alert days. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? 
Thank you for your presentation. Now we'll move to Alan Ewell, our last speaker. Hello there. Next slide, please. This report is asking me to identify, streamline, and reduce barriers for residents to fully apply for the Toronto Transit Commission's fare concessions and the fare pass discount. Next slide, please. This is to be done as part of the Toronto Transit Commission's five-year fare policy and 10-year fare collection outlook. Next slide, please. As most of you may currently know, there's a survey online that's being done in conjunction with YRT. There is a problem with the basic premise of both the survey and the request from the City Council in this report. This report talks about a fare for lower income residents. This reduction is calculated from the base TTC. Therein lies the problem. I started my 2022 budget presentation five minutes after doing my 2021 deputation on December 20th. It is about 90 cents, 90% is complete since December 31st. I have never once said that our single trip fare is too high. I've even been on record as saying our cash fare is way too low. Next slide, please. Part of the political defense for the 2021 budget is the province doesn't contribute to the operational costs to run the TTC. This is true. Next slide, please. The province hasn't contributed to the operating budget for Ontario Transit Agency for decades. Next slide, please. Madam Chair, here is the listing of 21 other transit agencies. This list is made exclusively of, Toronto, of Ontario Transit Agency. Next slide, please. The average number of trips to break even on these 21 Ontario Transit Agencies is 28.7 trips. The TTC is 48.75 trips to break even, or 24 trips more than the provincial average. And just in case you were paying attention last, uh, in December, the provincial average is actually lower than the national average that I presented in that presentation. Next slide, please. If you need further explanation, I can give it to you today if you want, or you can wait 10 months. Next slide. There is a computer acronym that's called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. Next slide. Until we fix the basic input of what a reasonable monthly pass price is, this report and the five-year policy and fare policy and 10-year fare collection outlook and survey are completely useless and a waste of thousands of dollars. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and I noticed that was a very nice picture of Commissioner Carroll unlike some of the other pictures there's going to be a complaint box Alan you picked the best picture of her come on let's make it fair across the board and standardize your photos um, I don't have a question for you I don't think I see any others so thank you for your presentation today uh, we're going to move to questions on this item um, I, I just I have to say all of this is wonderful except I'm confused. And so my question is, I believe it's the city of Toronto's responsibility to manage an issue, et cetera, the fair pass. And so I'm just a little bit nervous about, you know, I know that the TTC is clearly a partner, but it is like, are these motions, should they be moved here at the TTC or would they be better to, you know, would it be better if they were moved at Toronto City Council. I'm just I'm just a bit confused because I know the fair pass is run by the city. Kathleen. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Leary. Um, I might ask Angela also to um, fill in some of the details, but uh, we've been hearing from our partners that we work with at Fair Pass as well as um, from Presto that it's some of the Presto mechanisms that are making the barriers for people to access their fair pass. And because we hold the contract with Presto and the relationship with them, the uh, City of Toronto uh, people and our own citizens need to work through the TTC for us to push on Presto to solve the problems we've been talking about a long time, that there are, you know, shoppers is not readily available to people of low income and that kind of problem. So that's why I, I think um, certainly this motion from the City of Toronto the report before us is certainly appropriate and actionable by us through our processes. Um, the other motions from the board members, I, I might have to think about individually. 
you just, as we go through this process, clarify that for us, Kathleen, because um, I get, I definitely get the piece about the Presto and, and that we are the ones managing that um, mechanism. And so we would have to work on that, but I'm just, I just want to make sure we've got the motions happening in the right place. So you're saying uh, you have to wait and see the motions that are coming up. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Angela Gibson and I have to together. Okay, great. Thank you. Chair, you're on mute. We're hey, I'm sorry. My apologies. Commissioner Jade, Jade, Jade Dio, if you could go next, please. Uh, Jag Dio. Just, just, I'm going to like make like a little card for everybody just in case. Jag Dio. Jag Dio. Okay. Thank you for that correction. Uh, no, no, no worries. Um, I, I think, uh, Madam Chair, one of the deputants mentioned that uh, from an accessibility perspective, one of the, what, what I, what, what seems to me as a no brainer. For, for getting this card, i.e. through the phone, um, wasn't available to the population. Now, I just want to confirm, if, if that was the case, can staff comment on why applying for this um, fair pass cannot be done through a phone? Angela, are you familiar with why that, what that barrier is, please? No, I'm not. I, I I apologize through the chair. There are the original setup for the Fair Pass program was very similar to the to the way many of our other programs are set up, where it was done in person with an application, and so uh, and that was part of the issues that we had last year with the program not being able to take new applicants. So um, there, this has been we've been able this, with the city to. Uh, fix some of that so that they're, they're, you don't have to be in person to do the application process. So, um, and we will continue to work with Presto so there's more efficiency so you don't have to be an in-person application. But but I still have to go and deliver my application in person, though I filled it out like on my own. Is that is that the case? I don't have the answer to that, uh, Commissioner. I, I'd have to check with with the city, but I because I believe that was part of the the fix that we tried to do last year um, that could open up the application process to more people without having to do that in person. Okay, could you could you let me know on on what that looks like? I and I'm, I'm just like I, I think back to my days in the Toronto Public Library, and we 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 had this whole initiative around you know one in five kids within the city of Toronto don't have access to broadband, don't have access to internet, and that is such a, a, a huge gap, right? When we think about what's going to build a strong economy or what's going to help equalize the playing field, so just curious to find out, you know, why can't we create a system that employs a phone call and and understand some of the barriers more? It'd be great to get some answers on that. I'll get back to you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next um, uh, commissioner to ask questions is uh, Commissioner Osborne. Yeah, hi. Um, one of the deputants, I believe it was our second deputant, and then in some of the written correspondence referenced a noise that is made when the tap is made by the fair pass that is different and therefore stigmatizing uh, from the regular presto tap. And I'm wondering if this is the case. Through the chair, that is the case currently, but we have that itemized as one of the fixes that we've worked through with presto. So we are undertaking um, a human machine interface upgrade where we're going to do a number of different fixes so that one, that our customers, when they tap on their Presto card, they can see their balance um, of, of what's remaining on their Presto card. And that issue has is one of those other fixes that will make sure that gets eliminated. Um, so pre the fair card um, users will have the same experience as an adult fair card um, person. Okay, that, that's that's good because I was rather horrified to hear that it made a different sound. That's I don't understand the point of that at all. But anyway, we're fixing it, and in my opinion, not quickly enough. But uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Angela. Thank you, and Commissioner Carroll's next. 
Thanks. Yeah, following on that, um, I I'm troubled to 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 learn again. One of the deputants, um, I don't think they used the word, but it's what they were getting at. We're still hearing uh, through agencies. We're still hearing that what riders report is they're feeling profiled by transit enforcement officers when that different tone goes off. So I don't know how long the fix takes, but what is the message going out to our TEOs that that is not on? Um, through you, Madam Chair, of course, during the pandemic, we're using a completely different fair enforcement approach and um, uh, viewing um, the enforcement officers playing more of the customer service role. And so um, these are definitely questions that we have to um, we have to address when ridership starts to go up again after the pandemic, uh, worst of the pandemic is over. But it's being made clear to them that a different tone when you tap your, your Presto card doesn't mean you get special attention. Absolutely. Necessarily. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I don't think we can say it enough. Yeah. Um, to the, to the, to the, the length and breadth of things that, that were discussed here, uh, the chair is right. Some of the things that, that were mentioned by deputants are things that we have to address at SDF&A in Economic Development Committee, but it was forwarded here because of the, the, the Presto system uh, and, and where you go to pick up the, the media and all of the rest. Um, the having to to apply having to apply in person to your caseworker we know we have to fix that problem because the the next rung up when we move on with the the expansion of the fair pass program when we move into the working poor we're now talking about people who may have need for a means test but but they don't have a caseworker and so that's got to be fixed in that timeline and, and i when we do figure out that fix i i think I think the the intention is to forward that to the TTC as well, so that they'll will know that that work has been done. But um, what remains are all these other issues: the tone and and uh, what do you do if you lose your your special uh, fair pass uh, form of Presto Media? Those sorts of of accessibility issues and the ongoing Shoppers Drug Mart issue in certain parts of the city. Does all of that? Is all of that best forwarded to your five-year fair strategy, or, or are there any other places within the TTC that, that we need to forward some of the issues that you heard today? Or can we just make sure that in sending them to you, to the five-year fair strategy and outlook, they'll all end up with the right staff members? Uh, if they're all sent to me and Angela, they'll get to the right place because um, Angela is also responsible for current fair policy, and uh, and of course, uh, fair enforcement uh, is one of her peer heads. Michelle Jones uh, uh, works for me as well, so we're the group who will solve those problems. Okay, and and I think what I heard from from. Angela Gibson is that uh, some of them you are already working on. They're already a part and parcel of, of of Presto negotiations. So it'll go through that whole negotiative and governance system to 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 seek the improvements. So I know you asked uh, Angela the question, but we have even more balls in the air than we described to you in the report that was before you, <laughs> before you today. So on an ongoing basis, we are fixing and tweaking existing problems. So uh, it's important to, we're running a current operation at the same time as all the future stuff that was in our report today. So the issues that we can deal with right now with our fair card team um, that are within our contract and not a negotiation item. We'll be resolving those as fast as possible. And the HMI Angela described is a good example of that. Okay, and very last question, Madam Chair. Did you hear from the deputants, because they, they really covered everything we heard at economic development. I'm just wondering, did you hear anything new there? Do you need a motion to, to, to instruct anything? Or did you really, you heard the list of things that we have already discussed needing to be handled for accessibility and, and equity purposes. Do you need any motions or, or, or you feel it's covered in what you have already? I don't feel that I need any motions and I know that Angela and her staff were, were at the uh, committee meeting at City Hall as well. That's right, that's right. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to check that. Thanks, Madam Chair. Okay, I don't think we have any more questions, so we're going to move to speakers. And first up is Commissioner Lai, and she's got a motion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, first of all, I'd like to, uh, there's a motion just to clarify uh, the motion that is moved on council. And I just wanted to first and foremost, thank uh, Kathleen and your office to, to meet with me and to, to brief with me on uh, how these things all work. And I'm very, very happy that we can work together uh, with taking this uh, five year plan opportunity to uh, review, allow us to look at the senior affairs as well. And I, I'm a very strong believer that, uh, you know, we should uh, be a fair pass system to be, everybody should be fair. I think you should be fair to the seniors as well. And, uh, you know, there are, I wanted to just examine some of the other practice, practices in Ontario and around the world, how they've been dealing with senior affairs. And my office has been working closely and in discussion with, uh, with Honorable Raymond Cho, who was a former city councillor and who also happened to the Minister of S Seniors, responsible for seniors. So we are working together to examine some ways to enhance some of the senior affairs. Perhaps we will we'll get lucky and get some funding from them. And so it may take in many, many forms, different forms. So we just wanted to, uh, my motion just to, to uh, make sure that we, we will uh, look at different uh, form of trying to maybe start a pilot or whatever, just to think outside of the box and just to make sure that uh, um, we will be treating the, uh, uh, the, the senior in a fair ma manner. And you will notice that there, there's a communication uh, with, uh, with the TTC that uh, the two seniors association, one is the Senior East Indian Club and the other one is Ontario Chinese Seniors Association, which they have thousands of members and they really wanted to advocate for doing something for the seniors. And I will be actually hosting virtual town halls for some of the seniors to receive their input directly. So here is the motion. I hope I can count on my fellow commissioners uh, to support this motion and staff are on, on board with it and just wanted to make sure that uh, I can count on your support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my uh, remarks. Thank you very much. And we're going to move now to Commissioner Bradford, who also has a motion. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I will be brief. I, I just have a motion here um, that expands on the fair pass motions that we adopted at City Council last November. Uh, we're going to ask staff to look at a few areas where we could improve the fair pass program. Um, as, as we all know here at the Commission, uh, we very much need the support of Presto for some of these things. And uh, you may recall myself and uh, Commissioner De Laurentiis uh, are working with Metrolinx right now on the Joint Advisory Committee uh, with the help of uh, Kathleen Lewin Thomas and uh, Angel Gibson. We've had very productive conversations there, but there's, there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, I think from a fair strategy perspective, um, you know, it's really about the policy of what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, with the Fair Pass program, uh, and there's also an, an implementation piece that's really important, um, and and you know that is that's a big part of what we need to land. The TTC has specific needs uh, that Presto needs to deliver on. Uh, as we heard from some of our deputants, um, you know the Fair policy overall is is certainly moving in the right direction, but I think that there's an opportunity here for us to add some additional considerations based on the feedback and and based on the user experience. Um, we all received the correspondence from, from TTC riders, which I think is helpful. Uh, some helpful requests there for us to take a look at a few areas, including opportunities for partnerships, uh, in-person signups, and following on the findings of the, uh, the evaluation report. So this is going to help us continually improve the delivery of this important program uh, and make sure that we are responding to the feedback that we're receiving. That's it for me, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And I'll just say, um, oh, Councillor Commissioner Carroll, you go ahead. Well, thanks, Madam Chair. I don't have a motion. Um, I I just wanted to uh, point out uh, that that while while the the deputy that spoke earlier about about uh, uh, the the fair pass tone that is different from from a regular tap, and and that 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 they felt they were they were being judged by by transit enforcement officers. Uh, whether that's a perception or or a reality, I think we have to stop every time we hear that, and it's it's part of the reason I asked that that the follow up the on on the earlier you know the Black History incident at Wilson Station has to be reported to us as an item, an actionable item. It's 
It's not enough to just talk about when we think we're making gains. When we hear that that is happening, we have to stop and we have to make sure that there's a report back coming to us. Um, I, I asked earlier, incidents like this, they need to be numbered items. And yes, Delta and camera, no problem with that. They're personnel issues. But we have to, we have to hunt them out wherever we find them and get rid of them, uh, th these types of incidents. And so... A, we can fix the, the, the fair pass issue and make sure that the tone isn't there. But we also have to fix the perception issue and the experience issue if it's happening out there. And so, um, you know, where, where the deputy just sort of mentioned as part of their overall speech, we have to grab those moments and say, we just heard someone felt profiled on our system. And, and and look at what we're going to do about it. And so that's why I stopped to ask that question. Um, but I know that the, the technological solution is something that, that uh, our uh, staff are already working on. But I, I just wanted to assure the commission that the fact that I heard that, um, I, I expect that, that staff having heard it are going to follow up on it. I expect that you heard the, the same thing I heard and the, and the CEO is going to... Uh, to systemically deal with that. And I'm also going to take that back to, to economic development. Uh, we also are, are very well represented on this committee, members of economic development. So it will go back there to make sure that we're doing everything on the social development finance and admin side, that department, to make sure that they're creating a program in the first place that doesn't lead to you know, opportunities for stigmatizing and profiling. Um, those are my comments. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. And uh, I'll just uh, wrap up the meeting by saying I just want to be crystal clear and clarify that this is a city program. And certainly the TTC can support it from an operational perspective. And if there's barriers related to Presto, um, we can help with that. But anything related to the actual core program is a city function and anything related to expansion of the program would have to happen through the city. So I just want to make sure that's really clear. Uh, certainly our TTC staff have a lot on their plates and we don't want to duplicate and it is, it is being operated out of, the, out of City Hall. So uh, on that note, um, we'll put the motions up. Um, I'll be supporting them. And um, I guess we'll put up Councillor, Commissioner Lies first. And that's up on the screen now. And all in favor? Opposed, that carries. And now Commissioner Bradford, all in favor? Opposed, that carries. And now we just need a motion on the uh, report that was before us, or I guess it was kind of a transmittal, really. I guess we need a motion to adopt the council direction is probably the right thing to say. So all those in favor? Opposed, that carries. Uh, we are now officially adjourned. Thank you for a very long but important meeting, everyone, and good work. Great work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank Chair, you, everyone. Carol, come, oh, she's gone. Thanks to, uh, <laughs> thanks to our TTC staff for all the work related yes. to getting this up and running. Thank you, staff. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.